Christmas won't be Christmas without presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. Christmas won't be Christmas without presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got mother and father and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. We've got mother and father and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, We haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it thinking of father far away where the fighting was. She didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it thinking of father far away where the fighting was. Nobody spoke for a minute, then Meg said in an altered tone, You know, the reason Mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone. You know, the reason Mother proposed not having any presents this Christmas was because it is going to be a hard winter for everyone. And she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. And she thinks we ought not to spend money for pleasure when our men are suffering so in the army. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. We can't do much, but we can make our little sacrifices and ought to do it gladly. But I'm afraid I don't, and Meg shook her head as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I'm afraid I don't, and Meg shook her head as she thought regretfully of all the pretty things she wanted. But I don't think the little we should spend would do any good. We've each got a dollar and the army wouldn't be much help by our giving that. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy Undine and Sintram for myself. I agree not to expect anything from mother or you, but I do want to buy Undine and Sintram for myself. I've wanted it so long, said Joe, who was a bookworm. I plan to spend mine in new music, said Beth, with a little sigh which no one heard but the hearth brush and the kettle holder.
I plan to spend mine in new music, said Beth, with a little sigh which no one heard but the hearth brush and the kettle holder. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. I shall get a nice box of Faber's drawing pencils. I really need them, said Amy decidedly. Mother didn't say anything about our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Mother didn't say anything about our money, and she won't wish us to give up everything. Let's each buy what we want and have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Jo, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentlemanly manner. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it, cried Jo, examining the heels of her shoes in a gentlemanly manner. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. I know I do, teaching those tiresome children nearly all day when I'm longing to enjoy myself at home, began Meg in the complaining tone again. You don't have half such a hard time as I do, said Joe. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady? How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out the window or cry? Who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out the window or cry. It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It's naughty to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross and my hands get so stiff I can't practice well at all. And Beth looked at her rough hands with a sigh that anyone could hear that time. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, cried Amy. For you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and For you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses and and label your father if he isn't rich and insult you when your nose isn't nice. If you mean libel, I'd say so and not talk about labels as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe, laughing. If you mean libel, I'd say so and not talk about labels as if Papa was a pickle bottle, advised Joe, laughing. I know what I mean, and you needn't be satirical about it. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary, returned Amy with dignity. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary, returned Amy with dignity. Don't peck at one another, children. Don't you wish we had the money Papa lost when we were little, Joe?
"Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries," said Meg, who could remember better times. "Dear me, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries," said Meg, who could remember better times. You said the other day you thought we were a deal happier than the King children. For they were fighting and fretting all the time, in spite of all their money. For they were fighting and fretting all the time, in spite of all their money. So I did, Beth. Well, I think we are. For though we do have to work, we make fun for ourselves and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. For though we do have to work, we make fun for ourselves and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy with a reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rug. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy with a reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rug. Joe immediately sat up and put her hands on her pockets and began to whistle. Joe immediately sat up and put her hands on her pockets and began to whistle. Don't, Joe. That's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude, unladylike girls. I hate affected, nimmy, pimmy chits. I hate affected, nimmy, pimmy chits. Birds in their nests agree," sang Beth, the peacemaker, with such a funny face that. Birds in their nests agree," sang Beth, the peacemaker, with such a funny face that that both sharp voices softened to a laugh, and the pecking ended for that time. Really, girls, you are both to blame," said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elderly sister fashion. Really, girls, you are both to blame," said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elderly sister fashion. "You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better, Josephine." "You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better, Josephine." "It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl." But now you are so tall and turn up your hair. You should remember that you are a young lady. But now you are so tall and turn up your hair. You should remember that you are a young lady. I'm not. And if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm twenty. Cried Joe. I'm not, and if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm twenty. Cried Joe, pulling off her net and shaking down a chestnut mane. Pulling off her net and shaking down a chestnut mane. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss Marsh and wear long gowns and look as prim as a china aster. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss Marsh and wear long gowns and look as prim as a china aster. It's bad enough to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners.
It's bad enough to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy, and it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy, and it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa. And I can only stay at home and knit like a pokey old woman. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the needles rattled like castanets, and her ball bounded across the room. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the needles rattled like castanets, and her ball bounded across the room. Poor Joe, it's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls," said Beth. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls," said Beth. Stroking the rough head at her knee with a hand that all the dishwashing and dusting in the world could not make ungentle in its touch. Stroking the rough head at her knee with a hand that all the dishwashing and dusting in the world could not make ungentle in its touch. As for you, Amy continued, Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. As for you, Amy continued, Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant. But your absurd words are just as bad as Joe's slang. If Joe is a tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I, please? Asked Beth, ready to share the lecture. If Joe is a tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I, please? Asked Beth, ready to share the lecture. You're a dear, and nothing else. Answered Meg warmly, and no one contradicted her, for the mouse was the pet of the family. You're a dear, and nothing else. Answered Meg warmly, and no one contradicted her, for the mouse was the pet of the family. As young readers like to know how people look, we will take this moment to give them a little sketch of the four sisters. As young readers like to know how people look, we will take this moment to give them a little sketch of the four sisters who sat knitting away in the twilight while the December snow fell quietly without and the fire crackled cheerfully within. Who sat knitting away in the twilight while the December snow fell quietly without, and the fire crackled cheerfully within. It was a comfortable old room, though the carpet was faded and the furniture very plain. For a good picture or two hung on the walls.
It was a comfortable old room, though the carpet was faded and the furniture very plain. For a good picture or two hung on the walls. Books filled the recesses. Chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows, and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it. Books filled the recesses. Chrysanthemums and Christmas roses bloomed in the windows, and a pleasant atmosphere of home peace pervaded it. Margaret, being the eldest of the four, was sixteen and very pretty, being plump and fair with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair. Margaret, being the eldest of the four, was sixteen and very pretty, being plump and fair with large eyes, plenty of soft brown hair, a sweet mouth, and white hands of which she was rather vain. Fifteen-year-old Joe was very tall, thin, and brown, and reminded one of a colt. For she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. For she never seemed to know what to do with her long limbs, which were very much in her way. She had a decided mouth, a comical nose, and sharp gray eyes. Which appeared to see everything and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Which appeared to see everything and were by turns fierce, funny, or thoughtful. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled into a net to be out of her way. Her long, thick hair was her one beauty, but it was usually bundled into a net to be out of her way. Round shoulders had Joe, big hands and feet, a flyaway look to her clothes. Round shoulders had Joe, big hands and feet, a flyaway look to her clothes. And the uncomfortable appearance of a girl who was rapidly shooting up into a woman and didn't like it. And the uncomfortable appearance of a girl who was rapidly shooting up into a woman and didn't like it. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of thirteen. Elizabeth, or Beth, as everyone called her, was a rosy, smooth-haired, bright-eyed girl of thirteen, with a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression, which was seldom disturbed. With a shy manner, a timid voice, and a peaceful expression, which was seldom disturbed. Her father called her Little Tranquility, and the name suited her excellently. Her father called her Little Tranquility, and the name suited her excellently. For she seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only venturing out to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. For she seemed to live in a happy world of her own, only venturing out to meet the few whom she trusted and loved. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person in her own opinion, at least. Amy, though the youngest, was a most important person in her own opinion, at least. A regular snow maiden with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders. A 
a regular snow maiden with blue eyes and yellow hair curling on her shoulders, pale and slender and always carrying herself like a young lady mindful of her manners. Pale and slender and always carrying herself like a young lady mindful of her manners. What the characters of the four sisters were we will leave to be found out. The clock struck six and having swept up the hearth, Beth put out a pair of slippers down to warm. The clock struck six and having swept up the hearth, Beth put out a pair of slippers down to warm. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls. Her mother was coming and everyone brightened to welcome her. Somehow the sight of the old shoes had a good effect upon the girls. Her mother was coming and everyone brightened to welcome her. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked. Meg stopped lecturing and lighted the lamp. Amy got out of the easy chair without being asked. And Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. And Joe forgot how tired she was as she sat up to hold the slippers nearer to the blaze. They are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd get her some with my dollar, said Beth. No, I shall, cried Amy. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with a decided, I'm the man of the family now, Papa's away. I'm the oldest, began Meg, but Joe cut in with a decided, I'm the man of the family now, Papa's away. And I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. And I shall provide the slippers, for he told me to take special care of Mother while he was gone. I'll tell you what we'll do, Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. I'll tell you what we'll do, Beth. Let's each get her something for Christmas and not get anything for ourselves. That's like you, dear. What will we get? exclaimed Joe. Everyone thought soberly for a minute. Then Meg announced, as if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands. I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. As if the idea was suggested by the sight of her own pretty hands. I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had, cried Joe. Some handkerchiefs, all hemmed, said Beth. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left over to buy my pencils, added Amy. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left over to buy my pencils, added Amy. How will we give the things? asked Meg. Put them on the table and bring her in and see her open the bundles.
Don't you remember how we used to do it on our birthdays? Answered Joe. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the big chair with the crown on. I used to be so frightened when it was my turn to sit in the big chair with the crown on. And see you all come marching around to give the presents with a kiss. I like the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles," said Beth. I like the things and the kisses, but it was dreadful to have you sit looking at me while I opened the bundles," said Beth, who was toasting her face and the bread for tea at the same time. Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves, and then surprise her. You must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Meg. There is so much to do about the play for Christmas night," said Joe. Marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. Marching up and down with her hands behind her back and her nose in the air. I don't mean to act any more after this time. I'm getting too old for such things," observed Meg, who was as much a child as ever about dressing up frolics. I'm getting too old for such things," observed Meg, who was as much a child as ever about dressing up frolics. You won't stop, I know, as long as you can trail round in a white gown with your hair down and wear gold paper jewelry. You won't stop, I know, as long as you can trail round in a white gown with your hair down and wear gold paper jewelry. You're the best actress we've got, and there'll be an end of everything if you quit the boards," said Joe. You're the best actress we've got, and there'll be an end of everything if you quit the boards," said Joe. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and do the fainting scene, for you were as stiff as a poker in that. We ought to rehearse tonight. Come here, Amy, and do the fainting scene, for you were as stiff as a poker in that. I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint, and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue, tumbling flat as you do. I never saw anyone faint, and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue, tumbling flat as you do. If I can go down easily, I'll drop. If I can't, I shall fall into a chair and be graceful. I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol," returned Amy, who was not gifted with dramatic power. I don't care if Hugo does come at me with a pistol," returned Amy, who was not gifted with dramatic power. But was chosen because she was small enough to be borne out, shrieking by the villain of the piece. But was chosen because she was small enough to be borne out, shrieking by the villain of the piece. Do it this way. Clasp your hands so and stagger across the room, crying frantically. Rodrigo, save me, save me! And away went Joe with a melodramatic scream, which was truly thrilling.
Rodrigo, save me, save me! And away went Joe with a melodramatic scream, which was truly thrilling. Amy followed, but she poked her hands out stiffly before her and jerked herself along as if she went by machinery. Amy followed, but she poked her hands out stiffly before her and jerked herself along as if she went by machinery. and her ow was more suggestive of pins being run into her than of fear and anguish. And her ow was more suggestive of pins being run into her than of fear and anguish. Joe gave a despairing groan and Meg laughed outright while Beth let her bread burn as she watched the fun with interest. Joe gave a despairing groan and Meg laughed outright while Beth let her bread burn as she watched the fun with interest. It's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes and if the audience laughs, don't blame me. Come on, Meg. It's no use. Do the best you can when the time comes and if the audience laughs, don't blame me. Come on, Meg. Then things went smoothly, for Don Pedro defied the world in a speech of two pages without a single break. Then things went smoothly, for Don Pedro defied the world in a speech of two pages without a single break. Hagar the witch chanted an awful incantation over her kettle full of simmering toads with weird effect. Hagar the witch chanted an awful incantation over her kettle full of simmering toads with weird effect. Rodrigo rent his chains asunder manfully, and Hugo died in agonies of remorse and arsenic with a wild ha-ha. Rodrigo rent his chains asunder manfully, and Hugo died in agonies of remorse and arsenic with a wild ha-ha. It's the best we've had yet, said Meg, as the dead villain sat up and rubbed his elbows. It's the best we've had yet, said Meg, as the dead villain sat up and rubbed his elbows. I don't see how you can write and act such splendid things, Joe. You're a regular Shakespeare. I don't see how you can write and act such splendid things, Joe. You're a regular Shakespeare. Exclaimed Beth, who firmly believed that her sisters were gifted with wonderful genius in all things. exclaimed Beth, who firmly believed that her sisters were gifted with wonderful genius in all things. Not quite, replied Joe modestly. I do think the witch's curse and operatic tragedy is a rather nice thing, but I'd like to try Macbeth if we only had a trapdoor for Banquo. I do think the witch's curse and operatic tragedy is a rather nice thing, but I'd like to try Macbeth if we only had a trapdoor for Banquo. I always wanted to do the killing part. Is that a dagger that I see before me? Muttered Joe, rolling her eyes and clutching at the air as she had seen a famous tragedian do. muttered Joe, rolling her eyes and clutching at the air as she had seen a famous tragedian do. No, it's the toasting for with mother's shoe on it instead of the bread. No, it's the toasting for with mother's shoe on it instead of the bread. 
Beth's stage struck, cried Meg, and the rehearsal ended in a general burst of laughter. Beth stage struck, cried Meg, and the rehearsal ended in a general burst of laughter. Glad to find you so merry, my girls, said a cheery voice at the door. An actors and audience turned to welcome a tall, motherly lady with a can I help you look about her, which was truly delightful. And actors and audience turned to welcome a tall, motherly lady with a can I help you look about her, which was truly delightful. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble looking woman. And the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. And the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. Well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do in getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home to dinner. There was so much to do in getting the boxes ready to go tomorrow that I didn't come home to dinner. Has anyone called, Beth? How is your cold, Meg? Joe, you look tired to death. Come and kiss me, baby. While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. Marsh got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, While making these maternal inquiries, Mrs. Marsh got her wet things off, her warm slippers on, and sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. And sitting down in the easy chair, drew Amy to her lap, preparing to enjoy the happiest hour of her busy day. The girls flew about, trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. The girls flew about, trying to make things comfortable, each in her own way. Meg arranged the tea table. Joe brought wood and set chairs, dropping, overturning, and clattering everything she touched. Meg arranged the tea table. Joe brought wood and set chairs, dropping, overturning, and clattering everything she touched. Beth trotted to and fro between parlor and kitchen, quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone, and she sat with her hands folded. Beth trotted to and fro between parlor and kitchen, quiet and busy, while Amy gave directions to everyone, and she sat with her hands folded. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. As they gathered about the table, Mrs. March said with a particularly happy face, I've got a treat for you after supper. A quick bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. A quick bright smile went round like a streak of sunshine. Beth clapped her hands regardless of the biscuit she held, and Joe tossed up her napkin crying, Beth clapped her hands regardless of the biscuit she held, and Joe tossed up her napkin, crying, A letter! A letter! Three cheers for father! 
Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and an especial message to you girls, said Mrs. March. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and an especial message to you girls, said Mrs. March. Patting her pocket as if she had got a treasure there. Hurry and get done. Don't stop and quirk your little finger and simper over your plate, Amy, cried Joe. Hurry and get done. Don't stop and quirk your little finger and simper over your plate, Amy, cried Joe. Choking in her tea and dropping her bread, butter side down on the carpet in her haste to get at the treat. Choking in her tea and dropping her bread, butter side down on the carpet in her haste to get at the treat. Beth ate no more but crept away to sit in her shadowy corner and brood over the delight to come till the others were ready. Beth ate no more but crept away to sit in her shadowy corner and brood over the delight to come till the others were ready. I think it was so splendid in father to go as a chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg warmly. I think it was so splendid in father to go as a chaplain when he was too old to be drafted and not strong enough for a soldier, said Meg warmly. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer of Ivan, what's its name, or a nurse, so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe with a groan. Don't I wish I could go as a drummer of Ivan, what's its name, or a nurse, so I could be near him and help him, exclaimed Joe with a groan. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad-tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. It must be very disagreeable to sleep in a tent and eat all sorts of bad-tasting things and drink out of a tin mug, sighed Amy. When will he come home, Marmy? asked Beth with a little quiver in her voice. Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now come and hear the letter. They all drew to the fire, Mother in the big chair and Beth at her feet, Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair. They all drew to the fire, Mother in the big chair and Beth at her feet, Meg and Amy perched on either arm of the chair, and Joe leaning on the back, where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. And Joe leaning on the back, where no one would see any sign of emotion if the letter should happen to be touching. 
Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. Very few letters were written in those hard times that were not touching, especially those which fathers sent home. In this one, little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. In this one, little was said of the hardships endured, the dangers faced, or the homesickness conquered. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news. It was a cheerful, hopeful letter full of lively descriptions of camp life, marches, and military news. And only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. And only at the end did the writer's heart overflow with fatherly love and longing for the little girls at home. Give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. Tell them I think of them by day, pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I may see them. But remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. A year seems very long to wait before I may see them. But remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully. Fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them, I may be fonder and prouder than ever of my little women. Everybody sniffed when they came to that part. Jo wasn't ashamed of the gray tear that dropped off the end of her nose. And Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out. And Amy never minded the rumpling of her curls as she hid her face on her mother's shoulder and sobbed out. I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me by and by. I am a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he mayn't be disappointed in me by and by. We all will, cried Meg. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but I won't any more if I can help it. I'll try to be what he loves to call me, 
a little woman and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else. I'll try to be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else. said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. said Joe, thinking that keeping her temper at home was a much harder task than facing a rebel or two down south. Beth said nothing but wiped away her tears with a blue army sock and began to knit with all her might. Beth said nothing but wiped away her tears with a blue army sock and began to knit with all her might. Losing no time in doing the duty that lay nearest her, while she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all the father hoped to find her when the year brought round the happy coming home. While she resolved in her quiet little soul to be all the father hoped to find her when the year brought round the happy coming home. Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, Mrs. March broke the silence that followed Joe's words by saying in her cheery voice, Do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were little things? Nothing delighted you more than to have me tie my peace bags on your backs or burdens, give you hats and sticks and rolls of paper. Nothing delighted you more than to have me tie my peace bags on your backs or burdens, give you hats and sticks and rolls of paper. and let you travel through the house from the cellar, which was the city of destruction, up up to the housetop. And let you travel through the house from the cellar, which was the city of destruction, up up to the housetop, where you had all the lovely things you could collect to make a celestial city. What fun it was, especially going by the lions fighting Apollyon and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were, said Joe. What fun it was, especially going by the lions fighting Apollyon and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were, said Joe. I like the place where the bundles fell off and tumbled downstairs, said Meg. I like the place where the bundles fell off and tumbled downstairs, said Meg. My favorite part was when we came out on the flat roof where our flowers and arbors and pretty things were. My favorite part was when we came out on the flat roof where our flowers and arbors and pretty things were. And all stood and sung for joy up there in the sunshine, said Beth, smiling, as if that pleasant moment had come back to her. And all stood and sung for joy up there in the sunshine, said Beth, smiling, as if that pleasant moment had come back to her. I don't remember much about it, except I was afraid of the cellar and the dark entry. I 
I don't remember much about it except I was afraid of the cellar and the dark entry and always liked the cake and milk we had at the top. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it over again, said Amy. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it over again, said Amy, who began to talk of renouncing childish things at the mature age of 12. Who began to talk of renouncing childish things at the mature age of 12. We never are too old for this, my dear, because it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. We never are too old for this, my dear, because it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. Our burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide. Our burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide. that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. That leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrim, suppose you begin again, not in play but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before Father comes home. Now, my little pilgrim, suppose you begin again, not in play but in earnest, and see how far on you can get before Father comes home. Really, Mother? Where are our bundles? asked Amy, who was a very literal young lady. Really, Mother? Where are our bundles? asked Amy, who was a very literal young lady. Each of you told what your burden was just now, except Beth. I rather think she hasn't got any, said her mother. Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters and envying girls with nice pianos and being afraid of people. Yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters and envying girls with nice pianos and being afraid of people. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did, for it would have hurt her feelings very much. Beth's bundle was such a funny one that everybody wanted to laugh, but nobody did, for it would have hurt her feelings very much. Let us do it, said Meg thoughtfully. It is only another name for trying to be good, and the story may help us. It is only another name for trying to be good, and the story may help us. For though we do want to be good, it's hard work and we forget and don't do our best. For though we do want to be good, it's hard work and we forget and don't do our best. We were in the slough of despond tonight and Mother came and pulled us out as help did in the book. We were in the slough of despond tonight and Mother came and pulled us out as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions like Christian. What shall we do about that? asked Joe, delighted with the fancy that which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty.
What shall we do about that? asked Joe, delighted with the fancy that which lent a little romance to the very dull task of doing her duty. Look under your pillows Christmas morning and you will find your guidebook, replied Mrs. March. Look under your pillows Christmas morning and you will find your guidebook, replied Mrs. March. They talked over the new plan while old Hannah cleared the table. Then out came the four little work baskets and the needles flew as the girls made sheets for Aunt March. Then out came the four little work baskets and the needles flew as the girls made sheets for Aunt March. It was uninteresting sewing, but tonight no one grumbled. They adopted Joe's plan of dividing the long seams into four parts and calling the quarters Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. They adopted Joe's plan of dividing the long seams into four parts and calling the quarters Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. And in that way they got on capitally, especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. And in that way they got on capitally, especially when they talked about the different countries as they stitched their way through them. At nine they stopped work and sang as usual before they went to bed. No one but Beth could get much music out of the old piano. but she had a way of softly touching the yellow keys and making a pleasant accompaniment to the simple songs they sang. But she had a way of softly touching the yellow keys and making a pleasant accompaniment to the simple songs they sang. May had a voice like a flute and she and her mother led the little choir. Amy chirped like a cricket, and Joe wandered through the airs at her own sweet will. Amy chirped like a cricket, and Joe wandered through the airs at her own sweet will. Always coming out at the wrong place with a croak or a quaver that spoiled the most pensive tune. Always coming out at the wrong place with a croak or a quaver that spoiled the most pensive tune. They had always done this from the time they could lisp quinkle quinkle little ta. And it had become a household custom for the mother was a born singer. The first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house singing like a lark. The first sound in the morning was her voice as she went about the house singing like a lark. And the last sound at night was the same cheery sound for the girls never grew too old for that familiar lullaby. And the last sound at night was the same cheery sound, for the girls never grew too old for that familiar lullaby. Joe was the first to wake in the gray dawn of Christmas morning. No stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago.
No stockings hung at the fireplace, and for a moment she felt as much disappointed as she did long ago when her little sock fell down because it was so crammed with goodies. When her little sock fell down because it was so crammed with goodies. Then she remembered her mother's promise and, slipping her hand under her pillow, drew out a little crimson covered book. Then she remembered her mother's promise and, slipping her hand under her pillow, drew out a little crimson covered book. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived. She knew it very well, for it was that beautiful old story of the best life ever lived. That it was a true guidebook for any pilgrim going on the long journey. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. She woke Meg with a Merry Christmas and bade her see what was under her pillow. A green covered book appeared with the same picture inside. And a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. And a few words written by their mother, which made their one present very precious in their eyes. Presently, Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also, one dove color, the other blue. Presently, Beth and Amy woke to rummage and find their little books also, one dove color, the other blue. And all sat looking at and talking about them while the east grew rosy with the coming day. And all sat looking at and talking about them while the east grew rosy with the coming day. In spite of her small vanities, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature which unconsciously influenced her sisters, especially Joe. In spite of her small vanities, Margaret had a sweet and pious nature which unconsciously influenced her sisters, especially Joe. Who loved her very tenderly and obeyed her because her advice was so gently given. Who loved her very tenderly and obeyed her because her advice was so gently given. Girls, said Meg seriously, looking from the tumbled head beside her to the two little nightcapped ones in the room beyond. Girls, said Meg seriously, looking from the tumbled head beside her to the two little nightcapped ones in the room beyond. Mother wants us to read and love and mind these books, and we must begin at once. Mother wants us to read and love and mind these books, and we must begin at once. We used to be faithful about it, but since father went away and all this war trouble unsettled us, we have neglected many things. We used to be faithful about it, but since father went away and all this war trouble unsettled us, we have neglected many things.
You can do as you please, but I shall keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning as soon as I wake. You can do as you please, but I shall keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning as soon as I wake. For I know it will do me good and help me through the day. Then she opened her new book and began to read. Joe put her arm round her and, leaning cheek to cheek, read also with the quiet expression so seldom seen on her restless face. Joe put her arm round her and, leaning cheek to cheek, read also with the quiet expression so seldom seen on her restless face. How good Meg is! Come, Amy, let's do as they do. I'll help you with the hard words, and they'll explain things if we don't understand. Whispered Beth. I'll help you with the hard words, and they'll explain things if we don't understand. Whispered Beth. Very much impressed by the pretty books and her sister's example. I'm glad mine is blue," said Amy. And then the rooms were very still while the pages were softly turned. And the winter sunshine crept in to touch the bright heads and serious faces with a Christmas greeting. And the winter sunshine crept in to touch the bright heads and serious faces with a Christmas greeting. Where is mother? asked Meg as she and Joe ran down to thank her for their gifts half an hour later. Where is mother? asked Meg as she and Joe ran down to thank her for their gifts half an hour later. Goodness only knows. Some poor creature come a begging, and your ma went straight off to see what was needed. Some poor creature come a begging, and your ma went straight off to see what was needed. There never was such a woman for giving away vittles and drink, clothes and fearin'. Replied Hanno. There never was such a woman for giving away vittles and drink, clothes and fearin', replied Hanno, who had lived with the family since Meg was born and was considered by them all more as a friend than a servant. Who had lived with the family since Meg was born and was considered by them all more as a friend than a servant. She will be back soon, I think. So fry your cakes and have everything ready," said Meg. Looking over the presents, which were collected in a basket and kept under the sofa, ready to be produced at the proper time. Looking over the presents, which were collected in a basket and kept under the sofa, ready to be produced at the proper time. Why, where is Amy's bottle of cologne? She added, as the little flask did not appear. She took it out a minute ago and went off with it to put a ribbon on it or some such notion. Replied Joe. She took it out a minute ago and went off with it to put a ribbon on it or some such notion," replied Joe, dancing about the room to take the first stiffness off the new army slippers.
How nice my handkerchiefs look, don't they? Hannah washed and ironed them for me, and I marked them all myself, said Beth. Looking proudly at the somewhat uneven letters which had cost her such labor. Looking proudly at the somewhat uneven letters which had cost her such labor. Bless the child. She's gone and put mother on them instead of M. March. How funny, cried Joe, taking up one. Is it right? I thought it was better to do it so because Meg's initials are M.M. And I don't want anyone to use these but Marmy, said Beth, looking troubled. It's all right, dear, and a very pretty idea, quite sensible too, for no one can ever mistake now. It's all right, dear, and a very pretty idea, quite sensible too, for no one can ever mistake now. It will please her very much, I know, said Meg with a frown for Joe and a smile for Beth. There's mother. Hide the basket, quick! cried Joe as a door slammed and steps sounded in the hall. There's mother. Hide the basket, quick! cried Joe as a door slammed and steps sounded in the hall. Amy came in hastily and looked rather abashed when she saw her sisters all waiting for her. Amy came in hastily and looked rather abashed when she saw her sisters all waiting for her. Where have you been and what are you hiding behind you? Asked Meg, surprised to see by her hood and cloak that lazy Amy had been out so early. Asked Meg, surprised to see by her hood and cloak that lazy Amy had been out so early. Don't laugh at me, Joe. I didn't mean anyone should know till the time came. I only meant to change the little bottle for a big one, and I gave all my money to get it, and I'm truly trying not to be selfish anymore. I only meant to change the little bottle for a big one, and I gave all my money to get it, and I'm truly trying not to be selfish anymore. As she spoke, Amy showed the handsome flask, which she replaced the cheap one. As she spoke, Amy showed the handsome flask, which she replaced the cheap one. And looked so earnest and humble in her little effort to forget herself. And looked so earnest and humble in her little effort to forget herself. Then Meg hugged her on the spot, and Joe pronounced her a trump. While Beth ran to the window and picked her finest rose to ornament the stately bottle. While Beth ran to the window and picked her finest rose to ornament the stately bottle. You see, I felt ashamed of my present after reading and talking about being good this morning. You see, I felt ashamed of my present after reading and talking about being good this morning. So I ran round the corner and changed it the minute I was up, and I'm so glad, for mine is the handsomest now.
So I ran round the corner and changed it the minute I was up, and I'm so glad, for mine is the handsomest now. Another bang of the street door sent the basket under the sofa and the girls to the table eager for breakfast. Another bang of the street door sent the basket under the sofa and the girls to the table eager for breakfast. Merry Christmas, Marmy. Many of them. Thank you for our books. We read some and mean to every day, they cried in chorus. Merry Christmas, little daughters. I'm glad you began at once and hope you will keep on. But I want to say one word before we sit down. Not far away from here lies a poor woman with a little newborn baby. Six children are huddled into one bed to keep from freezing, for they have no fire. There is nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. There is nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. My girls, will you give me them your breakfast as a Christmas present? They were all unusually hungry, having waited nearly an hour, and for a minute no one spoke. Only a minute, for Joe exclaimed impetuously. They were all unusually hungry, having waited nearly an hour, and for a minute no one spoke. Only a minute, for Joe exclaimed impetuously. I'm so glad you came before we began. May I go and help carry the things to the poor little children? Asked Beth eagerly. I shall take the cream and the muffins, added Amy heroically, giving up the articles she most liked. I shall take the cream and the muffins, added Amy heroically, giving up the articles she most liked. May was already covering the buckwheats and piling the bread into one big plate. I thought you'd do it, said Mrs. March, smiling as if satisfied. You shall all go and help me, and when we come back, we will have bread and milk for breakfast and make it up at dinner time. You shall all go and help me, and when we come back, we will have bread and milk for breakfast and make it up at dinner time. They were soon ready, and the procession set out. Fortunately, it was early, and they went through back streets so few people saw them, and no one laughed at the queer party. Fortunately, it was early, and they went through back streets so few people saw them, and no one laughed at the queer party. A poor, bare, miserable room it was, with broken windows, no fire, ragged bed, clothes, A poor, bare, miserable room it was, with broken windows, no fire, ragged bed, clothes, a sick mother, wailing baby, and a group of pale, hungry children cuddled under one old quilt trying to keep warm.
a sick mother, wailing baby, and a group of pale, hungry children cuddled under one old quilt trying to keep warm. How the big eyes stared and the blue lips smiled as the girls went in. Ach, mein Gott, it is good angels come to us, said the poor woman crying for joy. Funny angels in hoods and mittens, said Joe, and set them laughing. In a few minutes, it really did seem as if kind spirits had been at work there. Hannah, who had carried wood, made a fire and stopped up the broken panes with old hats and her own cloak. Hannah, who had carried wood, made a fire and stopped up the broken panes with old hats and her own cloak. Mrs. March gave the mother tea and gruel and comforted her with promises of help. while she dressed the little baby as tenderly as if it had been her own. The girls, meantime, spread the table, set the children round the fire, and fed them like so many hungry birds. The girls, meantime, spread the table, set the children round the fire, and fed them like so many hungry birds. laughing, talking, and trying to understand the funny, broken English. Das ist gut, die Engelkinder, cried the poor things as they ate and warmed their purple hands at the comfortable blaze. Das ist gut, die Engelkinder, cried the poor things as they ate and warmed their purple hands at the comfortable blaze. The girls had never been called angel children before and thought it very agreeable. Especially Joe, who had been considered a Sancho ever since she was born. That was a very happy breakfast, though they didn't get any of it. And when they went away, leaving comfort behind, I think there were not in all the city four merrier people than the hungry little girls who gave away their breakfasts and contented themselves with bread and milk on Christmas morning. who gave away their breakfasts and contented themselves with bread and milk on Christmas morning. That's loving our neighbor better than ourselves, and I like it, said Meg. As they sat out their presents while their mother was upstairs collecting clothes for the poor Hummels. as they sat out their presents while their mother was upstairs collecting clothes for the poor Hummels. Not a very splendid show, but there was a great deal of love done up in the few little bundles Not a very splendid show, but there was a great deal of love done up in the few little bundles and the tall vase of red roses, white chrysanthemums, and trailing vines which stood in the middle gave quite an elegant air to the table. And the tall vase of red roses, white chrysanthemums, and trailing vines which stood in the middle gave quite an elegant air to the table. She's coming. Strike up, Beth. Open the door, Amy. 
Three cheers for Marmy! cried Joe, prancing about while Meg went to conduct Mother to the seat of honor. Three cheers for Marmy! cried Joe, prancing about while Meg went to conduct Mother to the seat of honor. Beth played her gayest march. Amy threw open the door and Meg enacted escort with great dignity. Beth played her gayest march. Amy threw open the door and Meg enacted escort with great dignity. Mrs. March was both surprised and touched and smiled with her eyes full as she examined her presents and read the little notes which accompanied them. And smiled with her eyes full as she examined her presents and read the little notes which accompanied them. The slippers went on at once. A new handkerchief was slipped into her pocket, well scented with Amy's cologne. The slippers went on at once. A new handkerchief was slipped into her pocket, well scented with Amy's cologne. The rose was fastened in her bosom, and the nice gloves were pronounced a perfect fit. The rose was fastened in her bosom, and the nice gloves were pronounced a perfect fit. There was a good deal of laughing and kissing and explaining in the simple, loving fashion There was a good deal of laughing and kissing and explaining in the simple, loving fashion which makes these home festivals so pleasant at the time, so sweet to remember long afterward, and then all fell to work. Which makes these home festivals so pleasant at the time, so sweet to remember long afterward, and then all fell to work. The morning charities and ceremonies took so much time that the rest of the day was devoted to preparations for the evening festivities. The morning charities and ceremonies took so much time that the rest of the day was devoted to preparations for the evening festivities. Being still too young to go off into the theater and not rich enough to afford any great outlay of private performances. Being still too young to go off into the theater and not rich enough to afford any great outlay of private performances. The girls put their wits to work, and necessity being the mother of invention made whatever they needed. The girls put their wits to work, and necessity being the mother of invention made whatever they needed. Very clever were some of their productions. Pasteboard guitars, antique lamps made of old-fashioned butter boats covered with silver paper. Pasteboard guitars, antique lamps made of old-fashioned butter boats covered with silver paper. Gorgeous robes of old cotton, glittering with tin spangles from a pickle factory. Gorgeous robes of old cotton, glittering with tin spangles from a pickle factory. And armor covered with the same useful diamond-shaped bits left in sheets when the lids of tin preserve pots were cut out.
and armor covered with the same useful diamond-shaped bits left in sheets when the lids of tin preserve pots were cut out. And the big chamber was the scene of many innocent revels. No gentlemen were admitted, so Jo played male parts to her heart's content. and took immense satisfaction in a pair of russet leather boots given her by a friend who knew a lady who knew an actor. And took immense satisfaction in a pair of russet leather boots given her by a friend who knew a lady who knew an actor. These boots, an old foil, and a slash doublet once used by an artist for some picture, were Joe's chief treasures and appeared in all occasions. These boots, an old foil, and a slash doublet once used by an artist for some picture, were Joe's chief treasures and appeared in all occasions. The smallness of the company made it necessary for the two principal actors to take several parts apiece The smallness of the company made it necessary for the two principal actors to take several parts apiece and they certainly deserve some credit for the hard work they did in learning three or four different parts. and they certainly deserve some credit for the hard work they did in learning three or four different parts. Whisking in and out of various costumes and managing the stage besides. It was excellent drill for their memories, a harmless amusement, and employed many hours It was excellent drill for their memories, a harmless amusement, and employed many hours which otherwise would have been idle, lonely, or spent in less profitable society. Which otherwise would have been idle, lonely, or spent in less profitable society. On Christmas night, a dozen girls piled onto the bed. Which was the dress circle and sat before the blue and yellow chintz curtains in a most flattering state of expectancy. Which was the dress circle and sat before the blue and yellow chintz curtains in a most flattering state of expectancy. There was a good deal of rustling and whispering behind the curtain, a trifle of lamp smoke. There was a good deal of rustling and whispering behind the curtain, a trifle of lamp smoke. And an occasional giggle from Amy, who was apt to get hysterical in the excitement of the moment. and an occasional giggle from Amy, who was apt to get hysterical in the excitement of the moment. Presently, a bell sounded, the curtains flew apart, and the operatic tragedy began. A gloomy wood, according to the one playbill, was represented by a few scrubs in pots, green bays on the floor, and a cave in the distance. A gloomy wood, according to the one playbill, was represented by a few scrubs in pots, green bays on the floor, and a cave in the distance.
This cave was made with a clothes horse for a roof, bureaus for walls, and in it a small furnace in full blast. This cave was made with a clothes horse for a roof, bureaus for walls, and in it a small furnace in full blast with a black pot on it and an old witch bending over it. The stage was dark and the glow of the furnace had a fine effect, especially as real steam issued from the kettle when the witch took off the cover. The stage was dark and the glow of the furnace had a fine effect, especially as real steam issued from the kettle when the witch took off the cover. A moment was allowed for the first thrill to subside, then Hugo the villain stalked in with a clanking sword at his side. A moment was allowed for the first thrill to subside, then Hugo the villain stalked in with a clanking sword at his side. A slouched hat, black beard, mysterious cloak, and the boots. After pacing to and fro in much agitation, he struck his forehead and burst out in a wild strain, singing of his hatred to Rodrigo. After pacing to and fro in much agitation, he struck his forehead and burst out in a wild strain, singing of his hatred to Rodrigo, his love for Zara, and his pleasing resolution to kill the one and win the other. The gruff tones in Hugo's voice, with an occasional shout when his feelings overcame him, were very impressive. The gruff tones in Hugo's voice with an occasional shout when his feelings overcame him were very impressive. And the audience applauded the moment he paused for breath. Bowing with the air of one accustomed to public praise, he stole to the cavern and ordered Hagar to come forth with a commanding Bowing with the air of one accustomed to public praise, he stole to the cavern and ordered Hagar to come forth with a commanding What ho, minion, I need thee! Out came Meg with a gray horse hair hanging about her face, a red and black robe, a staff and cabalistic signs upon her cloak. Out came Meg with a gray horse hair hanging about her face, a red and black robe, a staff and cabalistic signs upon her cloak. Hugo demanded a potion to make Zara adore him and wanted to destroy Rodrigo. Hugo demanded a potion to make Zara adore him and wanted to destroy Rodrigo. Hagar, in a fine dramatic melody, promised both and proceeded to call up the spirit who would bring the love pills filter. Hagar, in a fine dramatic melody, promised both and proceeded to call up the spirit who would bring the love pills filter. Hither, hither, from thy home. Airy sprite, I bid thee come. Born of roses, fed on dew. Ch 
charms and potions canst thou brew? Bring me here with elfin speed the fragrant filter which I need. Make it sweet and swift and strong. Spirit, answer now my song. A soft strain of music sounded, and then at the back of the cave appeared a little figure in cloudy white. A soft strain of music sounded, and then at the back of the cave appeared a little figure in cloudy white. glittering wings, golden hair, and a garland of roses on its head. Waving a wand, it sang. Glittering wings, golden hair, and a garland of roses on its head. Waving a wand, it sang. Hither I come from my airy home, afar in the silver moon. Take the magic spell and use it well, or its power will vanish soon. And dropping a small gilded bottle at the witch's feet, the spirit vanished. Another chant from Hagar produced another apparition. Not a lovely one, for with a bang an ugly black imp appeared, and Another chant from Hagar produced another apparition. Not a lovely one, for with a bang an ugly black imp appeared, and having croaked a reply, tossed a dark bottle at Hugo and disappeared with a mocking laugh. Having croaked a reply, tossed a dark bottle at Hugo and disappeared with a mocking laugh. Having warbled his thanks and put the potions in his boots, Hugo departed and Hagar informed the audience that as he had killed a few of her friends in times past, Hugo departed and Hagar informed the audience that as he had killed a few of her friends in times past, She has cursed him and intends to thwart his plans and be revenged upon him. She has cursed him and intends to thwart his plans and be revenged upon him. Then the curtain fell and the audience reposed and ate candy while discussing the merits of the play. Then the curtain fell and the audience reposed and ate candy while discussing the merits of the play. A good deal of hammering went on before the curtain rose again. But when it became evident what a masterpiece of stage carpentering had been got up, no one murmured at the delay. But when it became evident what a masterpiece of stage carpentering had been got up, no one murmured at the delay. It was truly superb. A tower rose to the ceiling. Halfway up appeared a window with a lamp burning in. Tower rose to the ceiling. Halfway up appeared a window with a lamp burning in. And behind the white curtain appeared Zara in a lovely blue and silver dress waiting for Rodrigo. He came in gorgeous array with plumed cap, red cloak, chestnut love locks, a guitar, and the boots, of course. He came in gorgeous array with plumed cap, red cloak, chestnut love locks, a guitar, and the boots, of course. 
Kneeling at the foot of the tower, he sang a serenade in melting tones. Zero replied and, after a musical dialogue, consented to fly. Then came the grand effect of the play. Rodrigo produced a rope ladder with five steps to it, threw up one end, and invited Zara to descend. Rodrigo produced a rope ladder with five steps to it, threw up one end, and invited Zara to descend. Timidly, she crept from her lattice, put her hand on Rodrigo's shoulder, I was about to leap gracefully down when, alas, alas, for Zara, she forgot her train. It caught in the window. The tower tottered, leaned forward, fell with a crash, and buried the unhappy lovers in the ruins. It caught in the window. The tower tottered, leaned forward, fell with a crash, and buried the unhappy lovers in the ruins. A universal shriek arose as the rusted boots waved wildly from the wreck, and a golden head emerged, exclaiming, A universal shriek arose as the rusted boots waved wildly from the wreck, and a golden head emerged, exclaiming, I told you so! I told you so! With a wonderful presence of mind, Don Pedro, the cruel sire, rushed in and dragged out his daughter with a hasty aside. With a wonderful presence of mind, Don Pedro, the cruel sire, rushed in and dragged out his daughter with a hasty aside. Don't laugh. Act as if it was all right. And ordering Rodrigo up banished him from the kingdom with a wrath and scorn. Don't laugh. Act as if it was all right. And ordering Rodrigo up banished him from the kingdom with a wrath and scorn. Though decidedly shaken by the fall of the tower upon him, Rodrigo defied the old gentleman and refused to stir. Though decidedly shaken by the fall of the tower upon him, Rodrigo defied the old gentleman and refused to stir. This dawnless example fired Zara. She also defied her sire, and he ordered them both to the deepest dungeons of the castle. This dawnless example fired Zara. She also defied her sire, and he ordered them both to the deepest dungeons of the castle. A stout little retainer came in with chains and led them away. Looking very much frightened and evidently forgetting the speech he ought to have made. Looking very much frightened and evidently forgetting the speech he ought to have made. Act third was the castle hall, and here Hagar appeared, having come to free the lovers and finish Hugo. Act third was the castle hall, and here Hagar appeared, having come to free the lovers and finish Hugo. She hears him coming and hides, sees him put the potions into two cups of wine, bid the timid little servant. She hears him coming and hides, sees him put the potions into two cups of wine, bid the timid little servant.
to bear them to the captives in their cells, and tell them I shall come anon. To bear them to the captives in their cells, and tell them I shall come anon. The servant takes Hugo aside to tell him something, and Hagar changes the cups for two others, which are harmless. The servant takes Hugo aside to tell him something, and Hagar changes the cups for two others, which are harmless. Fernando, the minion, carries them away, and Hagar puts back the cup, which holds the poison meant for Rodrigo. Fernando, the minion, carries them away, and Hagar puts back the cup, which holds the poison meant for Rodrigo. Hugo, getting thirsty after a long warble, drinks it, loses his wits, and after a good deal of clutching and stamping, falls flat and dies. Hugo, getting thirsty after a long warble, drinks it, loses his wits, and after a good deal of clutching and stamping, falls flat and dies. While Hagar informs him what she has done in a song of exquisite power and melody. This was a truly thrilling scene, though some persons might have thought that. The sudden tr tumbling down of a quantity of long hair rather marred the effect of the villain's death. The sudden tr tumbling down of a quantity of long hair rather marred the effect of the villain's death. He was called before the curtain and with great propriety appeared, leading Hagar. Whose singing was considered more wonderful than all the rest of the performance put together. Whose singing was considered more wonderful than all the rest of the performance put together. Act 4th display the despairing Rodrigo on the point of stabbing himself because he has been told that Zara has deserted him. Act 4th display the despairing Rodrigo on the point of stabbing himself because he has been told that Zara has deserted him. Just as the dagger is at his heart, a lovely song is sung under his window, informing him that Zara is true, but in danger, and he can save her if he will. Just as the dagger is at his heart, a lovely song is sung under his window, informing him that Zara is true, but in danger, and he can save her if he will. A key is thrown in, which unlocks the door, and in a spasm of rapture, he tears off his chains and rushes away to find and rescue his lady love. A key is thrown in, which unlocks the door, and in a spasm of rapture, he tears off his chains and rushes away to find and rescue his lady love. Act 5th open with a stormy scene between Zara and Don Pedro. He wishes her to go into a convent, but she won't hear of it. And after a touching appeal, is about to faint when Rodrigo dashes in and demands her hand.
and after a touching appeal is about to faint when Rodrigo dashes in and demands her hand. Don Pedro refuses because he is not rich. They shout and gesticulate tremendously but cannot agree and Rodrigo is about to bear away the exhausted Zara. They shout and gesticulate tremendously but cannot agree and Rodrigo is about to bear away the exhausted Zara. when the timid servant enters with a letter and a bag from Hagar, who has mysteriously disappeared. When the timid servant enters with a letter and a bag from Hagar, who has mysteriously disappeared. The latter informs the party that she bequeaths untold wealth to the young heir and an awful doom to Don Pedro if he doesn't make them happy. The latter informs the party that she bequeaths untold wealth to the young heir and an awful doom to Don Pedro if he doesn't make them happy. The bag is opened and several quarts of tin money shower up down upon the stage till it is quite glorified with the glitter. The bag is open and several quarts of tin money shower up down upon the stage till it is quite glorified with the glitter. This entirely softens the stern sire. He consents without a murmur. All join in a joyful chorus. This entirely softens the stern sire. He consents without a murmur. All join in a joyful chorus. And the curtains fall upon the lovers kneeling to receive Don Pedro's blessing in attitudes of the most romantic grace. And the curtains fall upon the lovers kneeling to receive Don Pedro's blessing in attitudes of the most romantic grace. Tumultuous applause followed, but received an unexpected check for the cot bed on which the dress circle was built. Tumultuous applause followed, but received an unexpected check for the cot bed on which the dress circle was built. Suddenly shut up and extinguish the enthusiastic audience. Rodrigo and Don Pedro flew to the rescue and all were taken out unheard, though many were speechless with laughter. Rodrigo and Don Pedro flew to the rescue and all were taken out unheard, though many were speechless with laughter. The excitement had hardly subsided when Hannah appeared with Mrs. March's compliments and would the ladies walk down to supper. The excitement had hardly subsided when Hannah appeared with Mrs. March's compliments and would the ladies walk down to supper. This was a surprise even to the actors and when they saw the table they looked at one another in rapturous amazement. This was a surprise even to the actors and when they saw the table they looked at one another in rapturous amazement. It was like Marmee to get up, a little treat for them, but anything so fine as this was unheard of since the departed days of plenty. It was like Marmee to get up, a little treat for them, but anything so fine as this was unheard of since the departed days of plenty. 
There was ice cream, actually two dishes of it, pink and white, and cake and fruit and distracting French bonbons and There was ice cream, actually two dishes of it, pink and white, and cake and fruit and distracting French bonbons and in the middle of the table four great bouquets of hothouse flowers. It quite took their breath away, and they stared first at the table and then at their mother, who looked as if she enjoyed it immensely. It quite took their breath away, and they stared first at the table and then at their mother, who looked as if she enjoyed it immensely. Is it fairies? asked Amy. It's Santa Claus, said Beth. Mother did it, and Meg smiled her sweetest in spite of her gray beard and white eyebrows. Mother did it, and Meg smiled her sweetest in spite of her gray beard and white eyebrows. And Marsh had a good fit and sent the supper, cried Joe with a sudden inspiration. And Marsh had a good fit and sent the supper, cried Joe with a sudden inspiration. All wrong. Old Mr. Lawrence sent it, replied Mrs. March. The Lawrence boy's grandfather? What in the world put such a thing into his head? We don't know him, exclaimed Meg. The Lawrence boy's grandfather? What in the world put such a thing into his head? We don't know him, exclaimed Meg. Hannah told one of his servants about your breakfast party. He is an odd old gentleman, but that pleased him. Hannah told one of his servants about your breakfast party. He is an odd old gentleman, but that pleased him. He knew my father years ago, and he sent me a polite note this afternoon. saying he hoped I would allow him to express his friendly feeling toward my children by sending them a few trifles in honor of the day. Saying he hoped I would allow him to express his friendly feeling toward my children by sending them a few trifles in honor of the day. I could not refuse, and so you have a little feast at night to make up for the bread and milk breakfast. I could not refuse, and so you have a little feast at night to make up for the bread and milk breakfast. That boy put it into his head. I know he did. He's a capital fellow, and I wish we could get acquainted. That boy put it into his head. I know he did. He's a capital fellow, and I wish we could get acquainted. He looks as if he'd like to know us, but he's bashful, and Meg is so prim she won't let me speak to him when we pass, said Joe. He looks as if he'd like to know us, but he's bashful, and Meg is so prim she won't let me speak to him when we pass, said Joe. As the plates went around and the ice began to melt out of sight, with O's and ahs of satisfaction. As the plates went around and the ice began to melt out of sight, with O's and ahs of satisfaction. You mean the people who live in the big house next door, don't you? asked one of the girls.
My mother knows old Mr. Lawrence, but says he's very proud and doesn't like to mix with his neighbors. My mother knows old Mr. Lawrence, but says he's very proud and doesn't like to mix with his neighbors. He keeps his grandson shut up when he isn't riding or walking with his tutor and makes him study very hard. He keeps his grandson shut up when he isn't riding or walking with his tutor and makes him study very hard. We invited him to our party, but he didn't come. Mother says he's very nice, though he never speaks to us girls. We invited him to our party, but he didn't come. Mother says he's very nice, though he never speaks to us girls. Our cat ran away once, and he brought her back, and we talked over the fence, and we're getting on capitally, all about cricket and so on. Our cat ran away once, and he brought her back, and we talked over the fence, and we're getting on capitally, all about cricket and so on. When he saw Meg coming and walked off, I mean to know him some day, for he needs fun. I'm sure he does," said Joe decidedly. I mean to know him some day, for he needs fun. I'm sure he does," said Joe decidedly. I like his manners, and he looks like a little gentleman. So I've no objection to your knowing him if proper opportunity comes. I like his manners, and he looks like a little gentleman. So I've no objection to your knowing him if proper opportunity comes. He brought the flowers himself, and I should have asked him in if I had been sure what was going on upstairs. He brought the flowers himself, and I should have asked him in if I had been sure what was going on upstairs. He looked so wistful as he went away, hearing the frolic and evidently having none of his own. He looked so wistful as he went away, hearing the frolic and evidently having none of his own. It's a mercy you didn't, mother," laughed Joe, looking at her boots. But we'll have another play sometime that he can see. Perhaps he'll act. Wouldn't that be jolly? I never had such a fine bouquet before. How pretty it is! And Meg examined her flowers with great interest. I never had such a fine bouquet before. How pretty it is! And Meg examined her flowers with great interest. They are lovely, but Beth's roses are sweeter to me," said Mrs. March, smelling the half-dead posy in her belt. They are lovely, but Beth's roses are sweeter to me," said Mrs. March, smelling the half-dead posy in her belt. Beth nestled up to her and whispered softly, "I wish I could send my bunch to father." Beth nestled up to her and whispered softly, "I wish I could send my bunch to father." I'm afraid he isn't having such a merry Christmas as we are. Joe, Joe, where are you? cried Meg at the foot of the garret stairs.
Here, answered a husky voice from above, and running up, Meg found her sister eating apples and crying over the air of Redcliffe. Here, answered a husky voice from above, and running up, Meg found her sister eating apples and crying over the air of Redcliffe. wrapped up in a comforter on an old three-legged sofa by the sunny window. This was Joe's favorite refuge, and here she loved to retire with half a dozen russets and a nice book. This was Joe's favorite refuge, and here she loved to retire with half a dozen russets and a nice book. to enjoy the quiet and the society of a pet rat who lived nearby and didn't mind her a particle. To enjoy the quiet and the society of a pet rat who lived nearby and didn't mind her a particle. As Meg appeared scrabble whisked into his hole, Joe shook the tears off her cheeks and waited to hear the news. As Meg appeared scrabble whisked into his hole, Joe shook the tears off her cheeks and waited to hear the news. Such fun! Only see! A regular note of invitation from Mrs. Gardner for tomorrow night, cried Meg. Such fun! Only see! A regular note of invitation from Mrs. Gardner for tomorrow night, cried Meg. Waving the precious paper and then proceeding to read it with girlish delight. Mrs. Gardner would be happy to see Miss March and Miss Josephine at a little dance on New Year's Eve. Mrs. Gardner would be happy to see Miss March and Miss Josephine at a little dance on New Year's Eve. Marmy is willing we should go. Now what shall we wear? What's the use of asking that when you know we shall wear our poplins because we haven't got anything else, answered Jo with her mouth full. What's the use of asking that when you know we shall wear our poplins because we haven't got anything else, answered Jo with her mouth full. If only I had silk, sighed Meg. Mother says I may when I'm eighteen, perhaps, but two years is an everlasting time to wait. If only I had silk, sighed Meg. Mother says I may when I'm eighteen, perhaps, but two years is an everlasting time to wait. I'm sure our pops look like silk, and they are nice enough for us. Yours is as good as new, but I forgot the burn and tear in mine. Whatever shall I do? The burn shows badly and I can't take any out. You must sit still all you can and keep your back out of sight. The front is all right. I shall have a new ribbon for my hair and Marmy will lend me her little pearl pin. And my new slippers are lovely, and my gloves will do, though they aren't as nice as I'd like.
and my new slippers are lovely, and my gloves will do, though they aren't as nice as I'd like. Mine are spoiled with lemonade, and I can't get any new ones, so I shall have to go without, said Jo, who never troubled herself much about dress. Mine are spoiled with lemonade, and I can't get any new ones, so I shall have to go without, said Jo, who never troubled herself much about dress. You must wear gloves, or I won't go, cried Meg decidedly. Gloves are more important than anything else. You can't dance without them, and if you don't, I should be so mortified. Then I'll stay still. I don't care much for company, dancing. It's no fun to go sailing round. I like to fly about and cut capers. Then I'll stay still. I don't care much for company, dancing. It's no fun to go sailing round. I like to fly about and cut capers. You can't ask Mother for new ones. They are so expensive and you are so careless. She said when you spoil the others that she shouldn't get you any more this winter. She said when you spoil the others that she shouldn't get you any more this winter. Can't you make them do? I can hold them crumpled up in my hands so no one will know how stained they are. That's all I can do. I can hold them crumpled up in my hands so no one will know how stained they are. That's all I can do. No, I'll tell you how we can manage. Each wear one good one and carry a bad one. Don't you see? No, I'll tell you how we can manage. Each wear one good one and carry a bad one. Don't you see? Your hands are bigger than mine, and you will stretch my glove dreadfully, began Meg, whose gloves were a tender point with her. Your hands are bigger than mine, and you will stretch my glove dreadfully, began Meg, whose gloves were a tender point with her. Then I'll go without. I don't care what people say, cried Joe, taking up her book. You may have it, you may. Only don't stain it and do behave nicely. Don't put your hands behind you or stare or say, Christopher Columbus, will you? Don't worry about me. I'll be as prim as I can and not get into any scrapes if I can help it. Don't worry about me. I'll be as prim as I can and not get into any scrapes if I can help it. Now go and answer your note and let me finish this splendid story. So Meg went away to accept with thanks, look over her dress, and sing blithely as she did up her one real lace frill. So Meg went away to accept with thanks, look over her dress, and sing blithely as she did up her one real lace frill. While Joe finished her story, her four apples, and had a game of romps with Scrabble. On New Year's Eve, the parlor was deserted for the two younger girls play dressing maids.
On New Year's Eve, the parlor was deserted for the two younger girls play dressing maids. and the two elder were absorbed in the all-important business of getting ready for the party. And the two elder were absorbed in the all-important business of getting ready for the party. Simple as the toilets were, there was a great deal of running up and down Simple as the toilets were, there was a great deal of running up and down, laughing and talking, and at one time a strong smell of burned hair pervaded the house. Laughing and talking, and at one time a strong smell of burned hair pervaded the house. Meg wanted a few curls about her face, and Joe undertook the pin to pinch the papered locks with a pair of hot tongs. Meg wanted a few curls about her face, and Joe undertook the pin to pinch the papered locks with a pair of hot tongs. Ought they to smoke like that? asked Beth from her perch on the bed. It's the dampness drying, replied Joe. What a queer smell. It's like burned feathers, observed Amy, smoothing her own pretty curls with a superior air. What a queer smell. It's like burned feathers, observed Amy, smoothing her own pretty curls with a superior air. There now, I'll take off the papers and you'll see a cloud of little ringlets, said Joe, putting down the tongs. There now, I'll take off the papers and you'll see a cloud of little ringlets, said Joe, putting down the tongs. She did take off the papers, but no cloud of ringlets appeared. for the hair came with the papers, and the horrified hairdresser laid a row of little scorch bundles on the bureau before her victim. For the hair came with the papers, and the horrified hairdresser laid a row of little scorch bundles on the bureau before her victim. Oh, 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 what have you done? I'm spoiled. I can't go. My hair, oh, my hair. Wailed Meg, looking with despair at the uneven frizzle on her forehead. Wailed Meg, looking with despair at the uneven frizzle on her forehead. Just my luck. You shouldn't have asked me to do it. I always spoil everything. I'm so sorry, but the tongs are too hot, and so I've made a mess. Groaned poor Joe regarding the black pancakes with tears of regret. Groaned poor Joe regarding the black pancakes with tears of regret. It isn't spoiled. Just frizzle it and tie a ribbon so the ends come on your forehead a bit, and it will look like the last fashion. It isn't spoiled. Just frizzle it and tie a ribbon so the ends come on your forehead a bit, and it will look like the last fashion. I've seen many girls do it so, said Amy consolingly. Serves me right for trying to be fine. I wish I'd let my hair alone, cried Meg petulantly. Serves me right for trying to be fine. I wish I'd let my hair alone, cried Meg petulantly. 
Serves me right for trying to be fine. I wish I'd let my hair alone, cried Meg petulantly. So do I. It was so smooth and pretty. But it will soon grow out again, said Beth, coming to kiss and comfort the shorn sheep. But it will soon grow out again, said Beth, coming to kiss and comfort the shorn sheep. After various lesser mishaps, Meg was finished at last, and by the united exertions of the family, Joe's hair was got up and her dress on. After various lesser mishaps, Meg was finished at last, and by the united exertions of the family, Joe's hair was got up and her dress on. They looked very well in their simple suits, Meg in silvery drab with a blue velvet snud, lace frills, and the pearl pin. They looked very well in their simple suits, Meg in silvery drab with a blue velvet snud, lace frills, and the pearl pin. Joe in maroon with a stiff gentlemanly linen collar and a white chrysanthemum or two for her only ornament. Joe in maroon with a stiff gentlemanly linen collar and a white chrysanthemum or two for her only ornament. Each put on one nice light glove and carried one soiled one and all pronounced the effect quite easy and fine. Each put on one nice light glove and carried one soiled one and all pronounced the effect quite easy and fine. Meg's high-heeled slippers were very tight and hurt her, though she would not own it. Meg's high-heeled slippers were very tight and hurt her, though she would not own it. And Joe's 19 hairpins all seemed stuck straight into her head, which was not exactly comfortable. But dear me, let us be elegant or die! And Joe's 19 hairpins all seemed stuck straight into her head, which was not exactly comfortable. But dear me, let us be elegant or die. Have a good time, dearies, said Mrs. March as the sisters went daintily down the walk. Don't eat much supper and come away at eleven when I send Hannah for you. As the gate clashed behind them, a voice cried from a window. Girls, girls, have you both got nice pocket handkerchiefs? Yes, yes, Spandy nice, and Meg has cologne on hers, cried Joe, adding with a laugh as they went on. Yes, yes, Spandy nice, and Meg has cologne on hers, cried Joe, adding with a laugh as they went on. I do believe Marmy would ask that if we were all running away from an earthquake. It is one of her aristocratic tastes, and quite proper for a real lady, is always known by her neat boots, gloves, and handkerchief.
It is one of her aristocratic tastes and quite proper for a real lady is always known by her neat boots, gloves, and handkerchief. replied Meg, who had a good many little aristocratic tastes of her own. Now don't forget to keep the bad breath out of sight, Joe. Is my sash right, and does my hair look very bad, said Meg as she turned from the glass in Mrs. Gardner's dressing room after a prolonged prank. Is my sash right, and does my hair look very bad, said Meg as she turned from the glass in Mrs. Gardner's dressing room after a prolonged prank. I know I shall forget. If you see me doing anything wrong, just remind me by a wink, will you? Returned Joe, giving her collar a twitch and her head a hasty brush. If you see me doing anything wrong, just remind me by a wink, will you? Returned Joe, giving her collar a twitch and her head a hasty brush. Now, winking isn't ladylike. I'll lift my eyebrows if anything is wrong and nod if you are all right. Now hold your shoulders straight and take short steps. And don't shake hands if you are introduced to anyone. It isn't the thing. Now hold your shoulders straight and take short steps. And don't shake hands if you are introduced to anyone. It isn't the thing. How do you learn all the proper ways? I never can. Isn't that music gay? Down they went, feeling a trifle timid, for they seldom went to parties, and informal as this little gathering was, it was an event to them. For they seldom went to parties, and informal as this little gathering was, it was an event to them. Mrs. Gardner, a stately old lady, greeted them kindly and handed them over to the eldest of her six daughters. Mrs. Gardner, a stately old lady, greeted them kindly and handed them over to the eldest of her six daughters. Meg knew Sally and was at her ease very soon, but Joe, who didn't care much for girls or girlish gossips, Meg knew Sally and was at her ease very soon, but Joe, who didn't care much for girls or girlish gossips, stood about with her back carefully against the wall and felt as much out of place as a colt in a flower garden. Stood about with her back carefully against the wall and felt as much out of place as a colt in a flower garden. Half a dozen jovial lads were talking about skates in another part of the room, and she longed to go and join them, for skating was one of her, the joys of her life. Half a dozen jovial lads were talking about skates in another part of the room, and she longed to go and join them, for skating was one of her, the joys of her life. She telegraphed her wish to Meg, but the eyebrows went up so alarmingly that she dared not stir.
She telegraphed her wish to Meg, but the eyebrows went up so alarmingly that she dared not stir. No one came to talk to her, and one by one the group near her dwindled away till she was left alone. No one came to talk to her, and one by one the group near her dwindled away till she was left alone. She could not roam about and amuse herself for the burned breath would show. So she stared at people rather forlornly till the dancing began. Meg was asked at once, and the tight slippers tripped about so briskly that none would have guessed the pain their wearer suffered smilingly. Meg was asked at once, and the tight slippers tripped about so briskly that none would have guessed the pain their wearer suffered smilingly. Jo saw a big red-headed youth approaching her corner, and fearing he meant to engage her, Jo saw a big red-headed youth approaching her corner, and fearing he meant to engage her, she slipped into a curtained recess, intending to peep and enjoy herself in peace. She slipped into a curtained recess, intending to peep and enjoy herself in peace. Unfortunately, another bashful person had chosen the same refuge. For as the curtain fell behind, she found herself face to face with the Lawrence boy. Dear me, I didn't know anyone was here, stammered Joe, preparing to back out as speedily as she'd bounced in. Dear me, I didn't know anyone was here, stammered Joe, preparing to back out as speedily as she'd bounced in. But the boy laughed and said pleasantly, though he looked a little startled, Don't mind me, stay if you like. But the boy laughed and said pleasantly, though he looked a little startled, Don't mind me, stay if you like. Shan't I disturb you? Not a bit. I came here because I don't know many people and felt rather strange at first, you know. Not a bit. I came here because I don't know many people and felt rather strange at first, you know. So did I. Don't go away, please, unless you'd rather. The boy sat down again and looked at his pumps till Joe said, trying to be polite and easy, The boy sat down again and looked at his pumps till Joe said, trying to be polite and easy, I think I've had the pleasure of seeing you before. You live near us, don't you? Next door. And he looked up and laughed outright. For Joe's prim manner was rather funny when he remembered how they had chatted about cricket when he brought the cat home. For Joe's prim manner was rather funny when he remembered how they had chatted about cricket when he brought the cat home. That put Joe at her ease, and she laughed too, as she said in her heartiest way, We did have such a good time over your nice Christmas present.
That put Jo at her ease, and she laughed too, as she said in her heartiest way, We did have such a good time over your nice Christmas present. Grandpa sent it. But you put it into his head, didn't you now? How is your cat, Miss March? asked the boy, trying to look sober while his black eyes shone with fun. How is your cat, Miss March? asked the boy, trying to look sober while his black eyes shone with fun. Nicely, thank you, Mr. Lawrence, but I'm not Miss March. I'm only Joe, returned the young lady. I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm only Lori. Lori Lawrence. What an odd name. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it, for the fellows called me Dora, so I made them say Lori instead. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it, for the fellows called me Dora, so I made them say Lori instead. I hate my name, too. So sentimental. I wish everyone would say Joe instead of Josephine. How did you make the boys stop calling you Dora? I thrashed them. I can't thrash Aunt Marsh, so I suppose I shall have to bear it. And Joe resigned herself with a sigh. I can't thrash Aunt Marsh, so I suppose I shall have to bear it. And Joe resigned herself with a sigh. Don't you like to dance, Miss Joe? asked Lori, looking as if he thought the name suited her. Don't you like to dance, Miss Joe? asked Lori, looking as if he thought the name suited her. I like it well enough if there is plenty of room and everyone is lively. I like it well enough if there is plenty of room and everyone is lively. In a place like this, I'm sure to upset something, tread on people's toes, or do something dreadful, so I keep out of mischief and let Meg sail about. In a place like this, I'm sure to upset something, tread on people's toes, or do something dreadful, so I keep out of mischief and let Meg sail about. Don't you dance? Sometimes. You see, I've been abroad a good many years and haven't been into company enough yet to know how you do things here. Sometimes. You see, I've been abroad a good many years and haven't been into company enough yet to know how you do things here. Abroad? cried Joe. Oh, tell me about it. I love dearly to hear people describe their travels. Abroad? cried Joe. Oh, tell me about it. I love dearly to hear people describe their travels. Lori didn't seem to know where to begin, but Joe's eager question soon set him going, and he told her how he had been at school the day. Lori didn't seem to know where to begin, but Joe's eager question soon set him going, and he told her how he had been at school the day.
where the boys never wore hats and had a fleet of boats on the lake, and for holiday fun went on walking trips about Switzerland with their teachers. Where the boys never wore hats and had a fleet of boats on the lake, and for holiday fun went on walking trips about Switzerland with their teachers. Don't I wish I'd been there? cried Joe. Did you go to Paris? We went last winter there. Can you talk French? We were not allowed to speak anything else at Vevey. Do say some. I can read it, but I can't pronounce. Que le nom à cette jeune demoiselle en les pantoufles jolies. How nicely you do it! Let me see. You said who is that young lady in the pretty slippers, didn't you? How nicely you do it! Let me see. You said who is that young lady in the pretty slippers, didn't you? Oui, mademoiselle. It's my sister Margaret, and you knew it was. Do you think she is pretty? Yes,、yeah, she makes me think of the German girls. She looks so fresh and quiet, and dances like a lady. Yes,、yeah, she makes me think of the German girls. She looks so fresh and quiet, and dances like a lady. Joe quite glowed with pleasure at this boyish praise of her sister, and stored it up to repeat to Meg. Joe quite glowed with pleasure at this boyish praise of her sister, and stored it up to repeat to Meg. Both peeped and criticized and chatted till they felt like old acquaintances. Both peeped and criticized and chatted till they felt like old acquaintances. Laurie's bashfulness soon wore off, for Joe's gentlemanly demeanor amused and set him at his ease. Laurie's bashfulness soon wore off, for Joe's gentlemanly demeanor amused and set him at his ease. And Joe was her merry self again because her dress was forgotten and nobody lifted their eyebrows at her. And Joe was her merry self again because her dress was forgotten and nobody lifted their eyebrows at her. She liked the Lawrence boy better than ever and took several good looks at him so that she might describe him to the girls. She liked the Lawrence boy better than ever and took several good looks at him so that she might describe him to the girls. For they had no brothers, very few male cousins, and boys were almost unknown creatures to them. For they had no brothers, very few male cousins, and boys were almost unknown creatures to them. Curly black hair, brown skin, big black eyes, handsome nose, fine teeth, small hands and feet. Curly black hair, brown skin, big black eyes, handsome nose, fine teeth, small hands and feet. Taller than I am, very polite for a boy, and altogether jolly. Wonder how old he is. It was on the tip of Joe's tongue to ask, but she checked herself in time, and with unusual tact tried to find out in a roundabout way.
It was on the tip of Joe's tongue to ask, but she checked herself in time and with unusual tact tried to find out in a roundabout way. I suppose you are going to college soon? I see you pegging away at your books. No, I mean studying hard. I suppose you are going to college soon? I see you pegging away at your books. No, I mean studying hard. And Joe blushed at the dreadful pegging which had escaped her. And Joe blushed at the dreadful pegging which had escaped her. Lori smiled but didn't seem shocked and answered with a shrug, Not for a year or two. I won't go before 17 anyway. Lori smiled but didn't seem shocked and answered with a shrug, Not for a year or two. I won't go before 17 anyway. Aren't you but 15? asked Joe, looking at the tall lad whom she had imagined 17 already. Aren't you but 15? asked Joe, looking at the tall lad whom she had imagined 17 already. 16 next month. How I wish I was going to college. You don't look as if you liked it. I hate it. Nothing but grinding or skylarking. And I don't like the way you fellows do either in this country. I hate it. Nothing but grinding or skylarking. And I don't like the way you fellows do either in this country. What do you like? To live in Italy and to enjoy myself in my own way. Joe wanted very much to ask what his own way was, but his black brows looked rather threatening as he knit them. Joe wanted very much to ask what his own way was, but his black brows looked rather threatening as he knit them. So she changed the subject by saying as her foot kept time, That's a splendid polka. Why don't you go and try it? So she changed the subject by saying as her foot kept time, That's a splendid polka. Why don't you go and try it? If you will come too, he answered with a gallant little bow. I can't, for I told Meg I wouldn't because there Joe stopped and looked undecided whether to tell or to laugh. I can't, for I told Meg I wouldn't because there Joe stopped and looked undecided whether to tell or to laugh. Because what? You won't tell? Never. Well, I have a bad trick of standing before the fire, and so I burn my frock. and I scorched this one, and though it's nicely mended, it shows, and Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. And I scorched this one, and though it's nicely mended, it shows, and Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. You may laugh if you want to. It is funny, I know. But Lori didn't laugh. He only looked down a minute, and the expression of his face puzzled Joe when he said very gently, Never mind that. I'll tell you how we can manage. He only looked down a minute, and the expression of his face puzzled Joe when he said very gently, Never mind that. I'll tell you how we can manage.
There's a long hallway out there, and we can dance grandly, and no one will see us. Please come. There's a long hallway out there, and we can dance grandly, and no one will see us. Please come. Joe thanked him and gladly went, wishing she had two neat gloves when she saw the nice pearl colored ones her partner wore. Joe thanked him and gladly went, wishing she had two neat gloves when she saw the nice pearl colored ones her partner wore. The hall was empty and they had a grand polka, for Lori danced well and taught her the German step. The hall was empty and they had a grand polka, for Lori danced well and taught her the German step. Which delighted Joe, being full of swing and spring. When the music stopped, they sat down on the stairs to get their breath. And Lori was in the midst of an account of a student's festival at Heidelberg when Meg appeared in search of her sister. And Lori was in the midst of an account of a student's festival at Heidelberg when Meg appeared in search of her sister. She beckoned and Joe reluctantly followed her into a side room where she found her on a sofa holding her foot and looking pale. She beckoned and Joe reluctantly followed her into a side room where she found her on a sofa holding her foot and looking pale. I've sprained my ankle. That stupid high heel turned and gave me a sad wrench. I've sprained my ankle. That stupid high heel turned and gave me a sad wrench. It aches so, I can hardly stand, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get home, she said, rocking to and fro in pain. It aches so, I can hardly stand, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get home, she said, rocking to and fro in pain. I knew you'd hurt your feet with those silly shoes. I'm sorry. But I don't see what you can do except get a carriage or stay here all night, answered Joe, softly rubbing the poor ankle as she spoke. But I don't see what you can do except get a carriage or stay here all night, answered Joe, softly rubbing the poor ankle as she spoke. I can't have a carriage without its costing ever so much. I dare say I can't get one at all, for most people come in their own, and it's a long way to the stable and no one to send. I dare say I can't get one at all, for most people come in their own, and it's a long way to the stable and no one to send. I'll go. No, indeed, it's past nine and dark as Egypt. I can't stop here, for the house is full. Sally has some girls staying with her. I'll rest till Hannah comes and then do the best I can. I'll ask Lori. He will go, said Joe, looking relieved as the idea occurred to her. Mercy, no! Don't ask or tell anyone. Get me my rubbers and put these slippers with our things. 
I can't dance anymore, but as soon as supper is over, watch for Hannah and tell me the minute she comes. I can't dance anymore, but as soon as supper is over, watch for Hannah and tell me the minute she comes. They are going out to supper now. I'll stay with you. I'd rather. No, dear, run along and bring me some coffee. I'm so tired, I can't stir. So Meg reclined with rubbers well hidden, and Joe went wandering away to the dining room. So Meg reclined with rubbers well hidden, and Joe went wandering away to the dining room, which she found after going into a china closet and opening the door of a room where old Mr. Gardner was taking a little private refreshment. which she found after going into a china closet and opening the door of a room where old Mr. Gardner was taking a little private refreshment. Making a dart at the table, she secured the coffee which she immediately spilled, thereby making the front of her dress as bad as the back. Making a dart at the table, she secured the coffee which she immediately spilled, thereby making the front of her dress as bad as the back. Oh dear, what a blunderbuss I am, exclaimed Joe, finishing Meg's glove by scrubbing her gown with it. Oh dear, what a blunderbuss I am, exclaimed Joe, finishing Meg's glove by scrubbing her gown with it. Can I help you? said a friendly voice, and there was Lori with a full cup in one hand and a plate of ice in the other. Can I help you? said a friendly voice, and there was Lori with a full cup in one hand and a plate of ice in the other. I was trying to get something for Meg, who was very tired, and someone shook me, and here I am in a nice state, answered Joe. I was trying to get something for Meg, who was very tired, and someone shook me, and here I am in a nice state, answered Joe. glancing dismally from the stained skirt to the coffee-colored glove. Glancing dismally from the stained skirt to the coffee-colored glove. Too bad. I was looking for someone to give this to. May I take it to your sister? Oh, thank you. I'll show you where she is. I don't offer to take it myself, for I should only get into another scrape if I did. I don't offer to take it myself, for I should only get into another scrape if I did. Joe led the way, and as if used to waiting on ladies, Lori drew up a little table, brought a second installment of coffee and ice for Joe, and Joe led the way, and as if used to waiting on ladies, Lori drew up a little table, brought a second installment of coffee and ice for Joe, and and was so obliging that even particular Meg pronounced him a nice boy. And was so obliging that even particular Meg pronounced him a nice boy. 
They had a merry time over the bonbons and mottos. and were in the midst of a quiet game of buzz with two or three other young people who had strayed in when Hannah appeared. and were in the midst of a quiet game of buzz with two or three other young people who had strayed in when Hannah appeared. Meg forgot her foot and rose so quickly that she was forced to catch hold of Joe with an exclamation of pain. Meg forgot her foot and rose so quickly that she was forced to catch hold of Joe with an exclamation of pain. Hush, don't say anything, she whispered, adding aloud. It's nothing. I turned my foot a little, that's all, and limped upstairs to put her things on. Hush, don't say anything, she whispered, adding aloud. It's nothing. I turned my foot a little, that's all, and limped upstairs to put her things on. Hannah scolded, Meg cried, and Joe was at her wit's end until she decided to take things into her own hands. Hannah scolded, Meg cried, and Joe was at her wit's end until she decided to take things into her own hands. Slipping out, she ran down and, finding a servant, asked if he could get her a carriage. Slipping out, she ran down and, finding a servant, asked if he could get her a carriage. It happened to be a hired waiter who knew nothing about the neighborhood, and Joe was looking round for help. It happened to be a hired waiter who knew nothing about the neighborhood, and Joe was looking round for help. When Lori, who had heard what she said, came up and offered his grandfather's carriage, which had just come for him, he said. When Lori, who had heard what she said, came up and offered his grandfather's carriage, which had just come for him, he said. It's so early. You can't mean to go yet, began Joe, looking relieved but hesitating to accept the offer. It's so early. You can't mean to go yet, began Joe, looking relieved but hesitating to accept the offer. I always go early. I do, truly. Please, let me take you home. It's all on my way, you know, and it rains, they say. I always go early. I do, truly. Please, let me take you home. It's all on my way, you know, and it rains, they say. That settled it, and telling him of Meg's mishap, Joe gratefully accepted and rushed up to bring down the rest of the party. That settled it, and telling him of Meg's mishap, Joe gratefully accepted and rushed up to bring down the rest of the party. Hannah hated rain as much as a cat does, so she made no trouble, and they rolled away in the luxurious clothes carriage, feeling very festive and elegant. Hannah hated rain as much as a cat does, so she made no trouble, and they rolled away in the luxurious clothes carriage, feeling very festive and elegant. Lori went on the box so Meg could keep her foot up, and the girls talked over their party in freedom.
Lori went on the box so Meg could keep her foot up, and the girls talked over their party in freedom. I had a capital time. Did you? asked Joe, rumpling up her hair and making herself comfortable. I had a capital time. Did you? asked Joe, rumpling up her hair and making herself comfortable. Yes, till I hurt myself. Sally's friend Annie Muffet took a fancy to me and asked me to come and spend a week with her when Sally does. Yes, till I hurt myself. Sally's friend Annie Muffet took a fancy to me and asked me to come and spend a week with her when Sally does. She is going in the spring when the opera comes, and it will be perfectly splendid if Mother only lets me go. She is going in the spring when the opera comes, and it will be perfectly splendid if Mother only lets me go. Answered Meg, cheering up at the thought. I saw you dancing with the red-headed man I ran away from. Was he nice? Oh, very. His hair is auburn, not red, and he was very polite. And I had a delicious rodeo with him. Oh, very. His hair is auburn, not red, and he was very polite. And I had a delicious rodeo with him. He looked like a grasshopper in a fit when he did the new step. Lori and I couldn't help laughing. Did you hear us? No, but it was very rude. What were you all about all that time hidden away there? Joe told her adventures, and by the time she'd finished, they were at home. With many thanks, they said good night and crept in, hoping to disturb no one. But the instant their door creaked, two little nightcaps bobbed up, and two sleepy but eager voices cried out. But the instant their door creaked, two little nightcaps bobbed up, and two sleepy but eager voices cried out. Tell about the party! Tell about the party! With what Meg called a great want of manners, Joe had saved some bonbons for the little girls. And they soon subsided after hearing the most thrilling events of the evening. I declare, it really seems like being a fine young lady to come home from the party in a carriage and sit in my dressing gown with a maid to wait upon me. I declare, it really seems like being a fine young lady to come home from the party in a carriage and sit in my dressing gown with a maid to wait upon me. Said Meg as Joe bound up her foot with arnica and brushed her hair. Said Meg as Joe bound up her foot with arnica and brushed her hair. I don't believe fine young ladies enjoy themselves a bit more than we do. In spite of our burnt hair, old gowns, one glove apiece, and tight slippers that sprain our ankles when we are silly enough to wear them. In spite of our burnt hair, old gowns, one glove apiece, and tight slippers that sprain our ankles when we are silly enough to wear them. And I think Joe was quite right.
Oh, dear, how hard it does seem to take up our packs and go on, sighed Meg, the morning after the party. Oh, dear, how hard it does seem to take up our packs and go on, sighed Meg, the morning after the party. For now, the holidays were over. The week of merrymaking did not fit her for going on easily with the tasks she never liked. For now, the holidays were over. The week of merrymaking did not fit her for going on easily with the tasks she never liked. I wish it was Christmas or New Year's all the time. Wouldn't it be fun, answered Joe, yawning dismally. I wish it was Christmas or New Year's all the time. Wouldn't it be fun, answered Joe, yawning dismally. We shouldn't enjoy ourselves half so much as we do now. But it does seem so nice to have little suppers and bouquets, and go to parties and drive home, and read and rest, and not work. But it does seem so nice to have little suppers and bouquets, and go to parties and drive home, and read and rest, and not work. It's like other people, you know. And I always envy girls who do such things. I'm so fond of luxury, said Meg. It's like other people, you know. And I always envy girls who do such things. I'm so fond of luxury, said Meg. Trying to decide which of two shabby gowns was the least shabby. Well, we can't have it. So don't let us grumble, but shoulder our bundles and trudge along as cheerfully as Marmy does. Well, we can't have it, so don't let us grumble, but shoulder our bundles and trudge along as cheerfully as Marmy does. I'm sure Aunt March is a regular old man of the sea to me. But I suppose, when I've learned to carry her without complaining, she will tumble off, or get so light that I shan't mind her. but I suppose when I've learned to carry her without complaining, she will tumble off or get so light that I shan't mind her. This idea tickled Joe's fancy and put her in good spirits. But Meg didn't brighten, for her burden, consisting of four spoiled children, seemed heavier than ever. This idea tickled Joe's fancy and put her in good spirits. But Meg didn't brighten, for her burden, consisting of four spoiled children, seemed heavier than ever. She had not heart enough even to make herself pretty, as usual, by putting on a blue neck ribbon and dressing her hair in the most becoming way. She
she had not heart enough even to make herself pretty, as usual, by putting on a blue neck ribbon and dressing her hair in the most becoming way. What's the use of looking nice when no one sees me but those cross midgets? What's the use of looking nice when no one sees me but those cross midgets? And no one cares whether I'm pretty or not, she muttered, shutting her drawer with a jerk. And no one cares whether I'm pretty or not, she muttered, shutting her drawer with a jerk. I shall have to toil and moil all my days, with only little bits of fun now and then, and get old and ugly and sour. I shall have to toil and moil all my days, with only little bits of fun now and then and get old and ugly and sour. Because I'm poor and can't enjoy my life as other girls do. It's a shame. So Meg went down wearing an injured look and wasn't at all agreeable at breakfast time. So Meg went down wearing an injured look and wasn't at all agreeable at breakfast time. Everyone seemed rather out of sorts and inclined to croak. Beth had a headache and lay on the sofa trying to comfort herself with the cat and three kittens. Beth had a headache and lay on the sofa, trying to comfort herself with the cat and three kittens. Amy was fretting because her lessons were not learned, and she couldn't find her rubbers. Joe would whistle and make a great racket getting ready. Mrs. March was very busy trying to finish a letter, which must go at once, and Hannah had the grumps for being up late didn't suit her. Mrs. March was very busy trying to finish a letter, which must go at once, and Hannah had the grumps for being up late didn't suit her. There never was such a cross family, cried Joe, Losing her temper when she had upset an inkstand, broken both boot lacings, and sat down upon her hat. Losing her temper when she had upset an inkstand, broken both boot lacings, and sat down upon her hat. You're the crossest person in it, returned Amy, washing out the sum that was all wrong with the tears that had fallen on her slate. You're the crossest person in it, returned Amy, washing out the sum that was all wrong with the tears that had fallen on her slate. Beth, if you don't keep these horrid cats down cellar, I'll have them drowned. exclaimed Meg angrily, as she tried to get rid of the kitten, which had scrambled up her back and stuck like a bird just out of reach. exclaimed Meg angrily, as she tried to get rid of the kitten, which had scrambled up her back 
and stuck like a bird just out of reach. Joe laughed, Meg scolded, Beth implored, and Amy wailed because she couldn't remember how much nine times twelve was. Joe laughed, Meg scolded, Beth implored, and Amy wailed because she couldn't remember how much nine times twelve was. Girls, girls, do be quiet one minute. I must get this off by the early mail. And you drive me distracted with your worry, cried Mrs. March, crossing out the third spoiled sentence in her letter. And you drive me distracted with your worry, cried Mrs. March, crossing out the third spoiled sentence in her letter. There was a momentary lull broken by Hannah, who stalked in, laid two hot turnovers on the table, and stalked out again. There was a momentary lull broken by Hannah, who stalked in, laid two hot turnovers on the table, and stalked out again. These turnovers were an institution, and the girls called them muffs. For they had no others, and found the hot pies very comforting to their hands on cold mornings. For they had no others, and found the hot pies very comforting to their hands on cold mornings. Hannah never forgot to make them, no matter how busy or grumpy she might be. For the walk was long and bleak. The poor things got no other lunch, and were seldom home before two. For the walk was long and bleak. The poor things got no other lunch and were seldom home before two. Cuddle your cats and get over your headache, Bethy. Goodbye, Marmy. We are all a set of rascals this morning, but we'll come home regular angels. Now then, Meg. And Joe tramped away, feeling that the pilgrims were not setting out as they ought to do. Now then, Meg. And Joe tramped away, feeling that the pilgrims were not setting out as they ought to do. They always looked back before turning the corner, for their mother was always at the window to nod and smile. And wave her hand to them. They always looked back before turning the corner, for their mother was always at the window to nod and smile, and wave her hand to them. Somehow it seemed as if they couldn't have got through the day without that. For whatever their mood might be, the last glimpse of that motherly face was sure to affect them like sunshine. For whatever their mood might be, the last glimpse of that motherly face was sure to affect them like sunshine. 
If Marmy shook her fist instead of kissing her hand to us, it would serve us right. For more ungrateful wretches than we are were never seen, cried Joe. If Marmy shook her fist instead of kissing her hand to us, it would serve us right. For more ungrateful wretches than we are were never seen, cried Joe. Taking a remorseful satisfaction in the snowy walk and bitter wind. "'Don't use such dreadful expressions,' replied Meg, "'from the depths of the veil in which she had shrouded herself "'like a nun sick of the world. "'Don't use such dreadful expressions,' replied Meg, "'from the depths of the veil in which she had shrouded herself "'like a nun sick of the world.' I like good strong words that mean something, replied Joe, catching her hat as it took a leap off her head, preparatory to flying away altogether. I like good strong words that mean something replied Joe, catching her hat as it took a leap off her head, preparatory to flying away altogether. Call yourself any names you like, but I am neither a rascal nor a wretch, and I don't choose to be called so. Call yourself any names you like, but I am neither a rascal nor a wretch, and I don't choose to be called so. You're a blighted being, and decidedly cross today, because you can't sit in the lap of luxury all the time. You're a blighted being, and decidedly cross today, because you can't sit in the lap of luxury all the time. Poor dear, just wait till I make my fortune, and you shall revel in carriages and... ice cream, and high-heeled slippers, and posies, and red-headed boys to dance with. How ridiculous you are, Joe. But Meg laughed at the nonsense and felt better in spite of herself. How ridiculous you are, Joe. But Meg laughed at the nonsense and felt better in spite of herself. Lucky for you I am. For if I put on crushed airs and tried to be dismal as you do, we should be in a nice state. Lucky for you I am, for if I put on crushed airs and tried to be dismal as you do, we should be in a nice state. Thank goodness I can always find something funny to keep me up. Don't croak any more, but come home jolly, there's a dear. Thank goodness I can always find something funny to keep me up. Don't croak any more, but come home jolly, there's a dear. Joe gave her sister an encouraging pat on the shoulder as they parted for the day, each going a different way, each hugging her little warm turnover.
Jo gave her sister an encouraging pat on the shoulder as they parted for the day, each going a different way, each hugging her little warm turnover. and each trying to be cheerful in spite of wintry weather, hard work, and the unsatisfied desires of pleasure-loving youth. And each trying to be cheerful in spite of wintry weather, hard work, and the unsatisfied desires of pleasure-loving youth. When Mr. March lost his property in trying to help an unfortunate friend, the two oldest girls begged to be allowed to do something toward their own support, at least. When Mr. March lost his property in trying to help an unfortunate friend, the two oldest girls begged to be allowed to do something toward their own support, at least. Believing that they could not begin too early to cultivate energy, industry, and independence, their parents consented. Believing that they could not begin too early to cultivate energy, industry, and independence, their parents consented. And both fell to work with the hearty goodwill which, in spite of all obstacles, is sure to succeed at last. And both fell to work with the hearty goodwill which, in spite of all obstacles, is sure to succeed at last. Margaret found a place as nursery governess and felt rich with her small salary. As she said, she was fond of luxury, and her chief trouble was poverty. She found it harder to bear than the others because she could remember a time when home was beautiful, life full of ease and pleasure, and want of any kind unknown. Because she could remember a time when home was beautiful, life full of ease and pleasure, and want of any kind unknown. She tried not to be envious or discontented. But it was very natural that the young girl should long for pretty things, gay friends, accomplishments, and a happy life. But it was very natural that the young girl should long for pretty things, gay friends, accomplishments, and a happy life. At the King's she daily saw all she wanted, for the children's older sisters were just out, and Meg caught frequent glimpses of dainty ball dresses and bouquets, At the King's she daily saw all she wanted, for the children's older sisters were just out, and Meg caught frequent glimpses of dainty ball dresses and bouquets. Heard lively gossip about theaters, concerts, sleighing parties, and merrymakings of all kinds. Heard lively gossip about theaters, concerts, sleighing parties, and merrymakings of all kinds. And saw money lavished on trifles, which would have been so precious to her.
poor Meg seldom complained, but a sense of injustice made her feel bitter toward everyone sometimes. Poor Meg seldom complained, but a sense of injustice made her feel bitter toward everyone sometimes. For she had not yet learned to know how rich she was in the blessings which alone can make life happy. For she had not yet learned to know how rich she was in the blessings which alone can make life happy. Joe happened to suit Aunt March, who was lame and needed an active person to wait upon her. Joe happened to suit Aunt March, who was lame and needed an active person to wait upon her. The childless old lady had offered to adopt one of the girls when the troubles came, and was much offended because her offer was declined. The childless old lady had offered to adopt one of the girls when the troubles came, and was much offended because her offer was declined. Other friends told the Marches that they had lost all chance of being remembered in the rich old lady's will, but the unworldly Marches only said, Other friends told the Marches that they had lost all chance of being remembered in the rich old lady's will, but the unworldly Marches only said, We can't give up our girls for a dozen fortunes, rich or poor. We will keep together and be happy in one another. We can't give up our girls for a dozen fortunes, rich or poor. We will keep together and be happy in one another. The old lady wouldn't speak to them for a time, but happening to meet Joe at a friend's, something in her comical face and blunt manners struck the old lady's fancy and she proposed to take her for a companion. Something in her comical face and blunt manners struck the old lady's fancy, and she proposed to take her for a companion. This did not suit Joe at all, but she accepted the place since nothing better appeared and, to everyone's surprise, got on remarkably well with her irascible relative. This did not suit Joe at all but she accepted the place since nothing better appeared and, to everyone's surprise, got on remarkably well with her irascible relative. There was an occasional tempest and once Joe marched home declaring she couldn't bear it longer but Aunt March always cleared up quickly. There was an occasional tempest, and once Joe marched home, declaring she couldn't bear it longer. But Aunt March always cleared up quickly. and sent for her to come back again with such urgency that she could not refuse, for in her heart she rather liked the peppery old lady.
and sent for her to come back again with such urgency that she could not refuse, for in her heart she rather liked the peppery old lady. I suspect that the real attraction was a large library of fine books which was left to dust and spiders since Uncle March died. I suspect that the real attraction was a large library of fine books which was left to dust and spiders since Uncle March died. Joe remembered the kind old gentleman who used to let her build railroads and bridges with his big dictionaries. Joe remembered the kind old gentleman who used to let her build railroads and bridges with his big dictionaries. Tell her stories about queer pictures in his Latin books and buy her cards of gingerbread whenever he met her in the street. Tell her stories about queer pictures in his Latin books, and buy her cards of gingerbread whenever he met her in the street. The dim, dusty room with the busts staring down from the tall bookcases, the cozy chairs, the globes. The dim, dusty room with the busts staring down from the tall bookcases, the cozy chairs, the globes. And best of all, the wilderness of books in which she could wander where she liked made the library a region of bliss to her. And best of all, the wilderness of books in which she could wander where she liked made the library a region of bliss to her. The moment Aunt March took her nap, or was busy with company, Joe hurried to this quiet place. The moment Aunt March took her nap, or was busy with company, Joe hurried to this quiet place. And curling herself up in the easy chair, devoured poetry, romance, history, travels, and pictures like a regular bookworm. and curling herself up in the easy chair, devoured poetry, romance, history, travels, and pictures like a regular bookworm. But like all happiness, it did not last long, for as sure as she had just reached the heart of the story, but like all happiness, it did not last long, for as sure as she had just reached the heart of the story. The sweetest verse of a song, or the most perilous adventure of her traveler, a shrill voice called, Josephine! Josephine! The sweetest verse of a song, or the most perilous adventure of her traveler, a shrill voice called, Josephine! Josephine! And she had to leave her paradise to wind yarn, wash the poodle, or read Belsham's essays by the hour together. And she had to leave her paradise to wind yarn, wash the poodle, or read Belsham's essays by the hour together. Joe's ambition was to do something very splendid. What it was, she had no idea as yet, but left it for time to tell her.
and meanwhile found her greatest affliction in the fact that she couldn't read, run, and ride as much as she liked. and meanwhile found her greatest affliction in the fact that she couldn't read, run, and ride as much as she liked. A quick temper, sharp tongue, and restless spirit were always getting her into scrapes. A quick temper, sharp tongue, and restless spirit were always getting her into scrapes. and her life was a series of ups and downs which were both comic and pathetic. But the training she received in Aunt March's was just what she needed. And the thought that she was doing something to support herself made her happy in spite of the perpetual Josephine? And the thought that she was doing something to support herself made her happy in spite of the perpetual Josephine? Beth was too bashful to go to school. It had been tried, but she suffered so much that it was given up, and she did her lessons at home with her father. It had been tried, but she suffered so much that it was given up, and she did her lessons at home with her father. Even when he went away and her mother was called to devote her skill and energy to soldiers' aid societies, Beth went faithfully on by herself and did the best she could. Even when he went away and her mother was called to devote her skill and energy to soldiers' aid societies, Beth went faithfully on by herself and did the best she could. She was a housewifely little creature and helped Hannah keep home neat and comfortable for the workers, never thinking of any reward but to be loved. She was a housewifely little creature and helped Hannah keep home neat and comfortable for the workers, never thinking of any reward but to be loved. Long, quiet days she spent, not lonely nor idle, for her little world was peopled with imaginary friends, and she was by nature a busy bee. Long, quiet days she spent, not lonely nor idle, for her little world was peopled with imaginary friends, and she was by nature a busy bee. There were six dolls to be taken up and dressed every morning, for Beth was a child still, and loved her pets as well as ever. There were six dolls to be taken up and dressed every morning, for Beth was a child still, and loved her pets as well as ever. Not one whole or handsome one among them, all were outcasts till Beth took them in, for when her sisters outgrew these idols, Not one whole or handsome one among them, 
all were outcasts till Beth took them in, for when her sisters outgrew these idols, they passed to her because Amy would have nothing old or ugly. Beth cherished them all the more tenderly for that very reason, and set up a hospital for infirm dolls. Beth cherished them all the more tenderly for that very reason, and set up a hospital for infirm dolls. No pins were ever stuck into their cotton vitals. No harsh words or blows were ever given them. No pins were ever stuck into their cotton vitals. No harsh words or blows were ever given them. No neglect ever saddened the heart of the most repulsive. But all were fed and clothed, nursed and caressed with an affection which never failed. But all were fed and clothed, nursed and caressed with an affection which never failed. One forlorn fragment of dullanity had belonged to Joe, and having led a tempestuous life, one forlorn fragment of dullanity had belonged to Joe, and having led a tempestuous life, was left a wreck in the rag bag, from which dreary poorhouse it was rescued by Beth and taken to her refuge. Was left a wreck in the rag bag, from which dreary poorhouse it was rescued by Beth and taken to her refuge. Having no top to its head, she tied on a neat little cap, and as both arms and legs were gone, having no top to its head, she tied on a neat little cap, and as both arms and legs were gone, she hid these deficiencies by folding it into a blanket and devoting her best bed to this chronic invalid. She hid these deficiencies by folding it into a blanket and devoting her best bed to this chronic invalid. If anyone had known the care lavished on that dolly, I think it would have touched their hearts, even while they laughed. If anyone had known the care lavished on that dolly, I think it would have touched their hearts, even while they laughed. She brought it bits of bouquets, she read to it, took it out to breathe fresh air, hidden under her coat. She sang it lullabies. She brought it bits of bouquets, she read to it, took it out to breathe fresh air, hidden under her coat. She sang it lullabies and never went to bed without kissing its dirty face and whispering tenderly, I hope you'll have a good night, my poor dear. And never went to bed without kissing its dirty face and whispering tenderly, I hope you'll have a good night, my poor dear. Beth had her troubles as well as the others, and not being an angel but a very human little girl, she often wept a little weep, as Joe said. Beth had her troubles as well as the others, 
and not being an angel, but a very human little girl, she often wept a little weep, as Joe said. because she couldn't take music lessons and have a fine piano. She loved music so dearly, tried so hard to learn, and practiced away so patiently at the jingling old instrument She loved music so dearly, tried so hard to learn, and practiced away so patiently at the jingling old instrument that it did seem as if someone, not to hint Aunt March, ought to help her. Nobody did, however, and nobody saw Beth wipe the tears off the yellow keys that wouldn't keep in tune when she was all alone. Nobody did, however, and nobody saw Beth wipe the tears off the yellow keys that wouldn't keep in tune when she was all alone. She sang like a little lark about her work, never was too tired for Marmy and the girls, and day after day said hopefully to herself, She sang like a little lark about her work, never was too tired for Marmy and the girls, and day after day said hopefully to herself, I know I'll get my music sometime, if I'm good. There are many Beths in the world, shy and quiet, sitting in corners till needed, and living for others so cheerfully that no one sees the sacrifices till the little cricket on the hearth stops chirping. And living for others so cheerfully that no one sees the sacrifices till the little cricket on the hearth stops chirping. and the sweet, sunshiny presence vanishes, leaving silence and shadow behind. If anybody had asked Amy what the greatest trial of her life was, she would have answered at once, My nose. If anybody had asked Amy what the greatest trial of her life was, she would have answered at once, My nose. When she was a baby, Joe had accidentally dropped her into the coal hod, and Amy insisted that the fall had ruined her nose forever. When she was a baby, Joe had accidentally dropped her into the coal hod, and Amy insisted that the fall had ruined her nose forever. It was not big nor red like poor Petria's. It was only rather flat, and all the pinching in the world could not give it an aristocratic point. It was not big nor red like poor Petria's. It was only rather flat, and all the pinching in the world could not give it an aristocratic point. No one minded it but herself, and it was doing its best to grow. But Amy felt deeply the want of a Grecian nose, and drew whole sheets of handsome ones to console herself.
but Amy felt deeply the want of a Grecian nose, and drew whole sheets of handsome ones to console herself. Little Raphael, as her sisters called her, had a decided talent for drawing, and was never so happy as when copying flowers, designing fairies, or illustrating stories with queer specimens of art. had a decided talent for drawing, and was never so happy as when copying flowers, designing fairies, or illustrating stories with queer specimens of art. Her teachers complained that instead of doing her sums, she covered her slate with animals. The blank pages of her atlas were used to copy maps on, Her teachers complained that instead of doing her sums, she covered her slate with animals. The blank pages of her atlas were used to copy maps on. And caricatures of the most ludicrous description came fluttering out of her books at unlucky moments. and caricatures of the most ludicrous description came fluttering out of her books at unlucky moments. She got through her lessons as well as she could, and managed to escape reprimands by being a model of deportment. She got through her lessons as well as she could, and managed to escape reprimands by being a model of deportment. She was a great favorite with her mates, being good-tempered and possessing the happy art of pleasing without effort. She was a great favorite with her mates, being good-tempered and possessing the happy art of pleasing without effort. Her little airs and graces were much admired. So were her accomplishments. Her little airs and graces were much admired. So were her accomplishments. For besides her drawing, she could play twelve tunes, crochet, and read French without mispronouncing more than two-thirds of the words. For besides her drawing, she could play twelve tunes, crochet, and read French without mispronouncing more than two-thirds of the words. She had a plaintive way of saying, When Papa was rich, we did so-and-so, which was very touching. She had a plaintive way of saying, when Papa was rich, we did so-and-so, which was very touching. And her long words were considered perfectly elegant by the girls. Amy was in a fair way to be spoiled, for everyone petted her, and her small vanities and selfishnesses were growing nicely. Amy was in a fair way to be spoiled, for everyone petted her, and her small vanities and selfishnesses were growing nicely. One thing, however, rather quenched the vanities. She had to wear her cousin's clothes.
Now Florence's mamma hadn't a particle of taste, and Amy suffered deeply at having to wear a red instead of a blue bonnet. Now Florence's mamma hadn't a particle of taste, and Amy suffered deeply at having to wear a red instead of a blue bonnet. Unbecoming gowns and fussy aprons that did not fit. Everything was good, well made, and little worn. But Amy's artistic eyes were much afflicted. Everything was good, well made, and little worn. But Amy's artistic eyes were much afflicted. Especially this winter, when her school dress was a dull purple with yellow dots and no trimming. Especially this winter, when her school dress was a dull purple with yellow dots and no trimming. My only comfort, she said to Meg with tears in her eyes, is that Mother doesn't take tucks in my dresses whenever I'm naughty, as Maria Parks' mother does. My only comfort, she said to Meg with tears in her eyes, is that Mother doesn't take tucks in my dresses whenever I'm naughty, as Maria Parks' mother does. My dear, it's really dreadful, for sometimes she is so bad her frock is up to her knees and she can't come to school. My dear, it's really dreadful, for sometimes she is so bad her frock is up to her knees and she can't come to school. When I think of this degradation, I figure, her, I can bear even my flat nose and purple gown with yellow skyrockets on it. When I think of this degradation, I figure, sir, I can bear even my flat nose and purple gown with yellow skyrockets on it. Meg was Amy's confidant and monitor, and by some strange attraction of opposites, Joe was gentle Beth's. Meg was Amy's confidant and monitor, and by some strange attraction of opposites, Joe was gentle Beth's. To Joe alone did the shy child tell her thoughts, and over her big harem scarum sister, Beth unconsciously exercised more influence than anyone in the family. To Joe alone did the shy child tell her thoughts, and over her big harem scarum sister, Beth unconsciously exercised more influence than anyone in the family. The two older girls were a great deal to one another. But each took one of the younger sisters into her keeping and watched over her in her own way. The two older girls were a great deal to one another, but each took one of the younger sisters into her keeping and watched over her in her own way.
playing mother, they called it, and put their sisters in the places of discarded dolls with the maternal instinct of little women. Playing mother, they called it, and put their sisters in the places of discarded dolls with the maternal instinct of little women. Has anybody got anything to tell? It's been such a dismal day. I'm really dying for some amusement, said Meg, as they sat sewing together that evening. Has anybody got anything to tell? It's been such a dismal day. I'm really dying for some amusement, said Meg, as they sat sewing together that evening. I had a queer time with Aunt today, and as I got the best of it, I'll tell you about it, began Joe, who dearly loved to tell stories. I had a queer time with Aunt today, and as I got the best of it, I'll tell you about it, began Joe, who dearly loved to tell stories. I was reading that everlasting Belsham and droning away as I always do, for Aunt soon drops off. I was reading that everlasting Belsham and droning away as I always do, for Aunt soon drops off. And then I take out some nice book and read like fury till she wakes up. I actually made myself sleepy, and before she began to nod, I gave such a gape. that she asked me what I meant by opening my mouth wide enough to take the whole book in at once. That she asked me what I meant by opening my mouth wide enough to take the whole book in at once. I wish I could and be done with it, said I, trying not to be saucy. Then she gave me a long lecture on my sins and told me to sit and think them over while she just lost herself for a moment. Then she gave me a long lecture on my sins and told me to sit and think them over while she just lost herself for a moment. She never finds herself very soon, so the minute her cap began to bob like a top-heavy dahlia, I whipped the vicar of Wakefield out of my pocket. She never finds herself very soon, so the minute her cap began to bob like a top-heavy dahlia, I whipped the vicar of Wakefield out of my pocket. and read away with one eye on him and one on Aunt. I'd just got to where they all tumbled into the water when I forgot and laughed out loud. I'd just got to where they all tumbled into the water when I forgot and laughed out loud. Aunt woke up and being more good-natured after her nap, told me to read a bit and show what frivolous work I preferred to the worthy and instructive Belsham. Aunt woke up and being more good-natured after her nap, told me to read a bit and show what frivolous work I preferred to the worthy and instructive Belsham.
I did my very best, and she liked it, though she only said, I don't understand what it's all about. Go back and begin it, child. Back I went and made the primroses as interesting as ever I could. Once I was wicked enough to stop in a thrilling place and say meekly, I'm afraid it tires you, ma'am. Shan't I stop now? Once I was wicked enough to stop in a thrilling place and say meekly, I'm afraid it tires you, ma'am. Shan't I stop now? She caught up her knitting, which had dropped out of her hands, gave me a sharp look through her speck, she caught up her knitting, which had dropped out of her hands, gave me a sharp look through her speck, and said in her short way, Finish the chapter and don't be impertinent, miss. Did she own she liked it? asked Meg. Oh, bless you, no. But she let old Belsham rest, and when I ran back after my gloves this afternoon, there she was. Oh, bless you, no. But she let old Belsham rest, and when I ran back after my gloves this afternoon, there she was. So hard at the vicar that she didn't hear me laugh as I danced a jig in the hall because of the good time coming. So hard at the vicar that she didn't hear me laugh as I danced a jig in the hall because of the good time coming. What a pleasant life she might have if only she chose. I don't envy her much, in spite of her money, for after all, rich people have about as many worries as poor ones, I think, added Joe. I don't envy her much, in spite of her money. For after all, rich people have about as many worries as poor ones, I think, added Joe. That reminds me, said Meg, that I've got something to tell. It isn't funny like Joe's story, but I thought about it a good deal as I came home. That reminds me, said Meg, that I've got something to tell. It isn't funny like Joe's story, but I thought about it a good deal as I came home. At the King's today, I found everybody in a flurry. And one of the children said that her oldest brother had done something dreadful, and Papa had sent him away. And one of the children said that her oldest brother had done something dreadful, and Papa had sent him away. I heard Mrs. King crying, and Mr. King talking very loud, and Grace and Ellen turned away their faces when they passed me. I heard Mrs. King crying, and Mr. King talking very loud, and Grace and Ellen turned away their faces when they passed me. So I shouldn't see how red and swollen their eyes were. I didn't ask any questions, of course, but I felt so sorry for them. 
and was rather glad I hadn't any wild brothers to do wicked things and disgrace the family. And was rather glad I hadn't any wild brothers to do wicked things and disgrace the family. I think being disgraced in school is a great deal tryinger than anything bad boys can do, said Amy. I think being disgraced in school is a great deal tryinger than anything bad boys can do, said Amy. Shaking her head as if her experience of life had been a deep one. Susie Perkins came to school today with a lovely red carnelian ring. I wanted it dreadfully, and I wished I was her with all my might. Well, she drew a picture of Mr. Davis with a monstrous nose and a hump, and the words, Young ladies, my eye is upon you, coming out of his mouth in a balloon thing. Well, she drew a picture of Mr. Davis with a monstrous nose and a hump, and the words, Young ladies, my eye is upon you, coming out of his mouth in a balloon thing. We were laughing over it when all of a sudden his eye was on us, and he ordered Susie to bring up her slate. We were laughing over it when all of a sudden his eye was on us, and he ordered Susie to bring up her slate. She was paralyzed with fright, but she went, and oh, what do you think he did? He took her by the ear. The ear! Just fancy how horrid. She was paralyzed with fright, but she went. And oh, what do you think he did? He took her by the ear. The ear! Just fancy how horrid! And led her to the recitation platform and made her stand there half an hour holding the slate so everyone could see. And led her to the recitation platform and made her stand there half an hour holding the slate so everyone could see. Didn't the girls laugh at the picture? asked Joe, who relished the scrape. Laugh? Not one. They sat still as mice, and Susie cried quarts. I know she did. Laugh? Not one. They sat still as mice, and Susie cried quarts. I know she did. I didn't envy her then, for I felt that millions of carnelian rings wouldn't have made me happy after that. I didn't envy her then, for I felt that millions of carnelian rings wouldn't have made me happy after that. I never, never should have got over such an agonizing mortification. And Amy went on with her work in the proud consciousness of virtue and the successful utterance of two long words in a breath.
and Amy went on with her work in the proud consciousness of virtue and the successful utterance of two long words in a breath. I saw something I liked this morning, and I meant to tell it at dinner, but I forgot, said Beth, putting Joe's topsy-turvy basket in order as she talked. I saw something I liked this morning, and I meant to tell it at dinner, but I forgot, said Beth, putting Joe's topsy-turvy basket in order as she talked. When I went to get some oysters for Hannah, Mr. Lawrence was in the fish shop. But he didn't see me, for I kept behind the fish barrel. And he was busy with Mr. Cutter, the fisherman. But he didn't see me, for I kept behind the fish barrel. And he was busy with Mr. Cutter, the fisherman. A poor woman came in with a pail and a mop and asked Mr. Cutter if he would let her do some scrubbing for a bit of fish. A poor woman came in with a pail and a mop and asked Mr. Cutter if he would let her do some scrubbing for a bit of fish. Because she hadn't any dinner for her children and had been disappointed of a day's work. Mr. Cutter was in a hurry and said no, rather crossly, so she was going away looking hungry and sorry. Mr. Cutter was in a hurry and said no, rather crossly, so she was going away looking hungry and sorry. when Mr. Lawrence hooked up a big fish with the crooked end of his cane and held it out to her. When Mr. Lawrence hooked up a big fish with the crooked end of his cane and held it out to her. She was so glad and surprised she took it right into her arms and thanked him over and over. She was so glad and surprised she took it right into her arms and thanked him over and over. He told her to go along and cook it, and she hurried off so happy. Wasn't it good of him? Oh, she did look so funny hugging the big slippery fish and hoping Mr. Lawrence's bed in heaven would be easy. Oh, she did look so funny hugging the big slippery fish and hoping Mr. Lawrence's bed in heaven would be easy. When they had laughed at Beth's story, they asked their mother for one, and after a moment's thought, when they had laughed at Beth's story, they asked their mother for one, and after a moment's thought, She said soberly, As I sat cutting out blue flannel jackets today at the rooms, I felt very anxious about father. She said soberly, As I sat cutting out blue flannel jackets today at the rooms, I felt very anxious about father. and thought how lonely and helpless we should be if anything happened to him. It was not a wise thing to do, but I kept on worrying till an old man came in with an order for some clothes. It was not a wise thing to do, but I kept on worrying till an old man came in with an order for some clothes. He sat down near me, and I began to talk to him, for he looked poor and tired and anxious.
"'Have you sons in the army?' I asked, "'for the note he brought was not to me. "'Yes, ma'am, I had four, "'but two were killed, one is a prisoner, "'and I'm going to the other who is very sick "'in a Washington hospital,' he answered quietly. Yes, ma'am, I had four, but two were killed, one is a prisoner, and I'm going to the other who is very sick in a Washington hospital, he answered quietly. You have done a great deal for your country, sir, I said, feeling respect now instead of pity. You have done a great deal for your country, sir, I said, feeling respect now instead of pity. Not a mite more than I ought, ma'am. I'd go myself if I was any use. As I ain't, I give my boys and give em free. Not a mite more than I ought, ma'am. I'd go myself if I was any use. As I ain't, I give my boys and give em free. He spoke so cheerfully, looked so sincere, and seemed so glad to give his all, that I was ashamed of myself. He spoke so cheerfully, looked so sincere, and seemed so glad to give his all, that I was ashamed of myself. I'd given one man, and thought it too much, while he gave four without grudging them. I had all my girls to comfort me at home, and his last son was waiting miles away to say goodbye to him, perhaps. I had all my girls to comfort me at home, and his last son was waiting miles away to say goodbye to him, perhaps. I felt so rich, so happy thinking of my blessings, that I made him a nice bundle, gave him some money. I felt so rich, so happy thinking of my blessings, that I made him a nice bundle, gave him some money, and thanked him heartily for the lesson he had taught me. Tell another story, mother, one with a moral to it like this. I like to think about them afterward. Tell another story, mother, one with a moral to it like this. I like to think about them afterward. If they are real and not too preachy, said Joe, after a minute's silence. Mrs. March smiled and began at once, for she had told stories to this little audience for many years and knew how to please them. Mrs. March smiled and began at once, for she had told stories to this little audience for many years and knew how to please them. Once upon a time there were four girls who had enough to eat and drink and wear, a good many comforts and pleasures, kind friends, Once upon a time there were four girls who had enough to eat and drink and wear, a good many comforts and pleasures, kind friends, and parents who loved them dearly, and yet they were not contented. Here the listeners stole sly looks at one another and began to sew diligently.
Here the listeners stole sly looks at one another and began to sew diligently. These girls were anxious to be good and made many excellent resolutions. But they did not keep them very well and were constantly saying, If only we had this, or if only we could do that, quite forgetting how much they already had and how many things they actually could do. If only we had this, or if only we could do that, quite forgetting how much they already had and how many things they actually could do. So they asked an old woman what spell they could use to make them happy. So they asked an old woman what spell they could use to make them happy. And she said, When you feel discontented, think over your blessings and be grateful. And she said, When you feel discontented, think over your blessings and be grateful. Here Joe looked up quickly, as if about to speak but changed her mind, seeing that the story was not yet done. Here Joe looked up quickly, as if about to speak, but changed her mind, seeing that the story was not yet done. Being sensible girls, they decided to try her advice, and soon were surprised to see how well off they were. Being sensible girls, they decided to try her advice, and soon were surprised to see how well off they were. One discovered that money couldn't keep shame and sorrow out of rich people's houses. One discovered that money couldn't keep shame and sorrow out of rich people's houses. Another, that though she was poor, she was a great deal happier with her youth, health, and good spirits. Another, that though she was poor, she was a great deal happier with her youth, health, and good spirits than a certain fretful, feeble old lady who couldn't enjoy her comforts. than a certain fretful, feeble old lady who couldn't enjoy her comforts. A third, that disagreeable as it was to help get dinner, it was harder still to go begging for it. A third, that disagreeable as it was to help get dinner, it was harder still to go begging for it. And the fourth, that even carnelian rings were not so valuable as good behavior. And the fourth, that even carnelian rings were not so valuable as good behavior. So they agreed to stop complaining, to enjoy the blessings they already possessed, So they agreed to stop complaining, to enjoy the blessings they already possessed, and try to deserve them, lest they should be taken away entirely instead of increased. And try to deserve them, lest they should be taken away entirely instead of increased. 
and I believe they were never disappointed or sorry that they took the old woman's advice. And I believe they were never disappointed or sorry that they took the old woman's advice. Now, Marmy, that is very cunning of you to turn our own stories against us and give us a sermon instead of a romance, cried Meg. Now, Marmy, that is very cunning of you to turn our own stories against us and give us a sermon instead of a romance, cried Meg. I like that kind of sermon. It's the sort father used to tell us, said Beth, thoughtfully, putting the needle straight on Joe's cushion. It's the sort father used to tell us, said Beth, thoughtfully, putting the needle straight on Joe's cushion. I don't complain near as much as the others do, and I shall be more careful than ever now. I don't complain near as much as the others do, and I shall be more careful than ever now. For I've had warning from Susie's downfall, said Amy morally. For I've had warning from Susie's downfall, said Amy morally. We needed that lesson, and we won't forget it. If we do so, you just say to us as old Chloe did and Uncle Tom. Tink up your marcies, chillin. Tink up your marcies. Added Joe, who could not, for the life of her, help getting a morsel of fun out of the little sermon. Added Joe, who could not, for the life of her, help getting a morsel of fun out of the little sermon, though she took it to heart as much as any of them.